aspect of love and light has really robbed people from their most authentic expression, how it has robbed people from being able to use their voice, the positive positivity community, how it's robbed people and really having the ability to share the truth of how they feel without feeling guilty, without feeling embarrassed, without feeling ashamed of just being exactly who they are. And when I wrote it in my book, I was still uncovering the truth for myself that it was actually a lot of people that I still wanted to cuss out. And not only did I still want to cuss them out, I didn't recognize that I still wanted to cuss them out until I was rehearsing what I wish I would have said in the mirror. And then it was like, oh, I'm not actually being truthful with myself about how I feel. I'm not actually being authentic in my expression because when someone wrongs me, I choose to be the bigger person. I choose to understand their trauma. I choose to understand their, their wounds. I'm very clear and well studied on human behavior and how that's mixed with karma and how it's also mixed with the woundedness and the trauma of a person. And I also understand that it's not okay. And I also understand that if you're going to do that, you're not going to do it over here. But I've also had the situation of the resentment that I have for myself because I never actually spoke up for myself and said what I needed to say. In the caption, it says, if 2024 is the year of truth, a lot of people are in for a rude awakening. Somehow society has plagued those who've been wronged with messages of being the bigger person turning the other cheek, loving light, and staying positive, but never addresses the emotionally wounded tyrants who run amok and intentionally hurt others. This methodology makes those who've suffered at the hands of others feel bad and guilty for wanting to speak their truth, use their voices, and stand up for themselves as if they should allow themselves to be mistreated for the sake of looking mature, emotionally intelligent, and like a good person. While those who lie, cheat, steal, and kill continue hurting others because the people they have hurt stay silent and attempt to be a good person or a bigger person. People are allowed to rebuke silence. They are allowed to use their words, embody their truths, and let the chips fall where they may. I used to think being a bigger person made me a better person until I recognized I was rehearsing arguments and things I wish I said by myself in the mirror months or years later. It took me a long time to accept that speaking my truth, calling out liars, doesn't mean I'm angry or resentful. It just meant enough was enough. And embodying my power also meant acknowledging what I no longer stand for. Don't love and like me when I attempt to protect, honor myself, and set firm boundaries on how I expect to be treated. Save the love and light messages for those who feed off manipulating and harming others, whether it's physically, emotionally, or mentally. Use your words and speak your truth. If people wanted you to speak nicely about them, then they should have treated you better. Ooh. When I listen to that video, I literally get chills because this is something that has been really playing on my heart and my mind for a long time. And you know, those that are close to me know that I had always said to myself, you know, very similarly for the reasons that she spoke about in that word that she just read out, that for the sake of being the bigger person or for the sake of, you know, wanting to resonate with other people's traumas and things that they may have gone through that led them to, you know, display certain behaviours, I was literally like dishonouring myself. Last week, I did say on the week before that I was going to do two more videos. Video, the last video on spirituality, and I was going to do the final video on melanin. But the reason why I've inserted this in here was because, you know, one, there were a few things that came up. And, you know, as I was working through a lot of my own, like, stuff, it dawned on me that this video fits perfectly within this series that we're doing on spirituality because I want people to really, like, understand how being involved and being, like, embedded in a particular, you know, faith group or a particular ideology can distort your, your reality in terms of, you know, things that happen happen to you, things that happen around you, and not fully being able to assess the truth. You know, I mentioned in last week's video that there's this idea, or people perceive this idea, or Sarah specifically, you know, spoke about this idea about when you get into the occult, you know, it blurs the lines between good and evil. 
but as I pointed out in the video, it's a hypocrisy because nowhere else have I ever seen in my life where people are able to see right and wrong and not be able to judge it or assess it or call it out for what it is and my hopes in sharing the deepness of this story is really to empower other women that i know i know all around the world whether they're christians muslims jews whatever you want to call it stuck in these religious based systems and because of their obligation or because of their you know their so-called devotion to god they refuse to call out their husbands their partners you know their abusive spouses for the sake of you know as she said being the bigger person or being the more righteous person because there's nothing less righteous than seeing evil and wickedness lying cheating stealing being played out right in front of you and everybody buries it and pretends like it's not happening and i'm i refuse to be complicit with that anymore so this is my story <sighs> I'm kind of glad that I get to just talk without having to refer to notes or whatever. Um, it wouldn't be a video of mine if I didn't whip out a book. So there is a, like, a book that I am going to refer to at some point in the video um, just to really bring my point home. But like, just see this is like a chit chat as if I'm just going to talk as if I'm talking to a friend. Um, but yeah, essentially, I kind of spoke about this, you know, a, a briefly in, you know, the first video I did. When I came back on my channel, um, I was in the church from 2009. I was in the church from 2009, and you know, when I came into the church, I was already a single parent. I had a little boy at the time, and I think he was roughly about eight months old or so. Um, and you know, when I came into the church, I was really broken, to be honest. I was really broken. I feel like, um, you know, prior to me actually coming into the church, I was dealing with a lot of heaviness um, to do with my past relationship. I was dealing with a lot of heaviness with regards to just being a parent because it wasn't something that I felt like I was prepared for and like I said in the last video as well um, now looking back I realized that you know there's a possibility that I could have been dealing with postnatal depression but it wasn't something that I, I really fully understood or was able to articulate at the time and so you know my vice was was you know going out raving and drinking and you know getting drunk pretty much all of the time. And so when I came into the church, even though I felt like I'd been, you know, restored and I'd been like renewed in a lot of, like in a lot of ways because um, I wasn't drinking anymore. Like literally as soon as I had committed my life to Christ in that sense, like I didn't touch a drop of alcohol again. And, you know, I was just going through the motions, you know, getting to know people, meet people, etc., etc. But there were a few situations and circumstances that happened that really knocked my self-esteem like especially when it came to you know the fact that I was a single parent and whatever um, and I carried a lot of that weight and a lot of that guilt again without really explaining to people or letting people know what was going on internally I internalized a lot of my emotions and it's really interesting because the lady who whose video I played her name is Candice so similar in a lot of ways and um, she's literally born a day before me and everything that she articulates is something that I completely resonate with in the sense that we're we're sensitive people we're very you know loving nurturing we have like a big heart towards people we're always bringing people in and but there's an aspect of us that is unable to withstand conflict like just the idea of being in any type of conflict whether it's an argument you know whether it's a disagreement whether it's a physical fight it just makes us physically well let me speak for myself it makes me physically sick like i cannot there's there was something about me and i'm saying was because it was something i literally couldn't deal with so anything i could do to kind of like um, avoid a confrontation, I would do it. So I kept a lot of things internalized. I didn't speak up about a lot of things and I was carrying a lot of weight. So anyway, fast forward to um, 2000 and I don't know, maybe 11 or 12, um, there was a guy that came into the church and at the time um, I'd heard of him from like other like girls that were in the church at the time and he was a lot younger than me so he was never somebody like I considered and um, the age gap between us is like six years and so when he came into the church I saw him like just how I saw the other quote-unquote like younger generation of the church at this point because of my 
like my self-esteem and my self like my value of self was so low it was something i became open to quite quickly I, I would say it didn't take very long for me to start to open up to this person and begin to like really think to myself like wow like actually yeah you are quite nice like you are good looking like maybe i should take an interest in you and that's kind of how it, that's how our relationship kind of blossomed at first it was a bit of like i felt like it was a bit of a taboo because of his age so you know fast forward um like a year or two um eventually um my pastor allowed us to date because because, you know when he first came in he was a bit you could say a bit rough around the edges and everybody and you know quite rightly was like we don't think this is the right person for you um he seems you know really immature he doesn't seem like he's the type of person that can look after you you know you're you know not that not it's not even literally just the fact that you're older than him in age just you know on a maturity level you guys are not on the same level do you get what i mean and Again, like I said, I completely overlooked all of that because at this point I was invested, you know, emotionally into this person. And so we started dating for a little while and everything seemed to be, you know, okay. Like the first red flag that really came up for me when we started dating was that he didn't really seem to understand boundaries when it came to, you know, me being touched. If I said, I don't want to do this, he would do it. And if I said I didn't feel comfortable with this, he would push it until I gave in. And so it was almost like I knew in the back of my mind there was no way that I could be in a relationship with somebody who didn't respect me and you know didn't respect my body in a sense like in the church at the time there were certain things that you just wouldn't do and I felt like he was always pushing the boat like as close to the edge as possible and it made me so uncomfortable but again it wasn't something that I was able to articulate because I was the type of personality that I could never really stand up for myself in that way that was the first red flag so anyway fast forward a little bit I can't remember at what point in our dating relationship this happened but there was a time when he was at my house. It's just one of those things. Maybe it was, you know, um, a trauma response from a previous relationship I'd had because this is something that I'd always kind of dealt with. Um, or maybe it was literally just my intuition speaking to me, but something was like, to pick up his phone and look at his phone. Another thing actually, um, there was a girl that he had literally come into the church with, as in him and this girl weren't like boyfriend and girlfriend per se, but they were kind of seeing each other. After a couple of months of like them being in the church, the girl that he came in with didn't stay. I used to kind of like follow up on her. So a lot of the younger girls um, that came into the church around that time, I was talking to them and they would always be at my house and we'd always be having fellowships and stuff. So I was quite close to her at one point. And so I still had her number in my phone. And so on WhatsApp, I remember she, you know, like when people used to upload statuses, I don't know if it was WhatsApp or Blackberry or whatever, but she put up a status that basically said, if you think your man's doing something, call cheaters. And something in me <laughs> was like, it just felt like a, a personal attack on me. Like just based on the fact that I know that she used to date him or she used to, um, she used to be involved with him. That cryptic message that she posted on her WhatsApp, plus the fact that, you know, like I said, it could have been a trauma response from a previous relationship. I was like, I'm gonna go through his phone. So he went to the toilet and I literally took his phone and I started going through his messages and found basically that he was talking to two girls. One of them was literally the girl who had posted that you know that um whatsapp status the girls he was talking to and they'd actually been out together you know to the cinema and he was talking to her and then there was another girl um i can't remember her name now but he was basically begging her to meet him and you know to come and see him because he wanted to be with her he wanted to see her he was desperate to see all of these like really desperate type of messages and literally as i was reading these messages like i was so confused like at this point it's like we had waited so long just to just to date like officially in the church because like I said, he was younger than me and my pastor was not not under the impression that he was somebody that I should even be with. And so the fact that he had literally waited all of that time, I think it was like a year and a half or maybe even two years, of us kind of like just talking as friends and not being allowed to date. It was like, how did we wait this long to date each other? We've been dating for a couple of months and already you're talking to other girls telling them that you want to be with them. I was so confused. Girl, not the girl who had the message because she, like I said, they actually ended up meeting up and going out with each other. She knew what she was doing. But the other girl was like, I know that you've got a girl because at this point we'd been posting each other on Instagram and whatever. So people knew that we were together. And you know, she was like, I know you've got a girl. Why are you, why are you saying you want to meet up with me if you've got a girlfriend? But anyway, I didn't even know what to think, how to feel. I was literally just so beside myself, so angry. I left the phone on the bed with the messages open so he knew that I'd seen it and just walked out of the house. So when he came out of the toilet and he realised what had gone on, he literally chased me down and followed me all the way to my friend's because I was walking to my friend's house like just to tell her like what the hell like this guy's got me messed up like look at what he's doing sort of thing. He was begging, I'm sorry, I don't know what I was doing, I don't know why I did this, all of this stuff. 
long story short we had this conversation and i can't fully remember all of the details but eventually i just said i told my pastor about what had happened and i just separated from him i was like no i can't do this like this is this is a madness like i'm not getting involved in this so we separated and the relationship ended there so yeah a couple of months down the line like during this period of time where we were like separated like he was going ham like sending messages he wasn't allowed to speak to me we weren't allowed to see each other he wasn't allowed to text my phone or whatever we weren't allowed to talk and so at this time he was spending a lot of time with my best friend at the time and um he would go there all the time and he would be like moping about how he wishes he could see me how he missed me um he was like he would always be kind of like sending messages through her about how he wanted to see me all of this stuff and you know when christmas came around i remember him buying me like loads of gifts like he bought me like trainer like two three pairs of trainers he bought me a jack like two jackets he bought me like um perfume like, and he wrote me this card like this long card just basically talking about how sorry he was and how like he realizes that it was you know it was just stupid and you know he wants to get back with me he's going to do right by me all of this stuff so fast forward a couple more months down the line you know he'd gone back to my pastor and basically said to him like rah like i know I, I made a mistake you know when i dated her last time but i'm serious this time like i want to be with her whatever whatever and i remember my pastor speaking to us um like together and he was just like look like this woman like you know that she's got a child like this is not a game like if you're you're saying that you want to be with her like you can't be playing around like it's not it's not a joke and he was like no this is who i want to be with now i'm going to be serious i'm going to marry her i'm ready to be a husband all of this stuff and i was like all right cool so we got back together and um we were married i would say from that point within i think seven months it was really quick and looking back it was very stupid like there was nothing in me that had seen you know a difference in his like behavior like i was saying the red flags that i'd seen before with regards to boundaries and not respecting my boundaries but again like i just feel like as women when you carry a low self-esteem it really doesn't matter you know what red flags are shown to you or what red flags you can see it's almost like you you choose to be blind to it it's like you see all these things but you're just like you're willing to almost ignore that for the sake of having somebody with you or having somebody by your side and that was literally what i was going through and so we were planning our wedding at this point and even throughout the wedding process or planning the wedding there was red flag after red flag and everything in me my intuition was screaming at me to end this relationship for good like this is not for you but i just I refused to listen. We got married 2014, November 2014, um, and it was just nice having who I considered my best friend with me all the time. Like when you're dating in church, obviously there's a lot of restrictions, or um, well, depending on the church you go to. But in our church specifically, there's a lot of restrictions with regards to like dating. You can't be out at a certain time. You know, you can't spend you know alone time together um, in certain places like there's a lot of rules that you have to kind of follow and so when we got married it was like finally like we can just chill you know we can just throw caution to the wind we can be with each other whatever whatever and so like it was amazing for me like I said being with someone who I consider with my best friend all day every day like I remember having a conversation with someone this year a couple of weeks ago and they were just like what would you say like was the best thing about being married and I was just like just literally just having your person like there's something amazing and so beautiful about having somebody that you that that you know will ride for you, that you ride for and will, you know that will ride for you. Like you have your inside jokes, you have your things that you tell each other. There's nothing that you feel like can come in between your bond. And that's how I felt at the time, you know, despite all of the things that had happened before in this, this, this short period of time, I felt like, you know, this was everything that I wanted and more and I was happy. So around, I would say, you know, three months later, around February time, this is like 2015 now, um, sorry, let's go back. So during our wedding, my um, ex-husband's best friend was obviously his best man. At the time, he was dating a girl um, that he told us about, oh yeah, I'm dating this girl, da -da 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 -da, I'm seeing this girl, blah, blah, blah. and he was like, oh, like, is it all right if I bring her to a wedding as a plus one? And we were like, oh yeah, that's fine, it's fine. So his best friend brings his girlfriend at the time to our wedding and that was the first day that we both met her um and so once we got married and um, because obviously we'd met them at the wedding and we were married now we used to have like double dates with them where we'd go to the cinema or we'd go out for like we just go out places there was another time we went bowling with each other and we just used to spend a lot of time together we used to talk on facetime like we were just really close like as a like couple on couple if that makes sense but then eventually um his best friend like ended the relationship with this girl it didn't go very well in a sense that you know she took it 
really badly and I actually felt really sorry for her but anyway during the time that we were kind of spending a lot of time together I used to invite them both to church as he would do I used to invite them both to church oh guys come church come church he he would come but he wasn't really into it and she would say things like oh she really wants to get involved in it or whatever she really wants to become dedicated to it or whatever but obviously because she was in this relationship with with um my husband's friend it was actually felt kind of drawn back or pulled back because he he, he wasn't really into it so anyway, um, I kind of lost contact with her. I didn't have a number for her or anything. So I just kind of, you know, going about, you know, my life or whatever else. Um, but a couple months down the line, I saw her twin sister at one of our events that we were having um, for the church. And I saw her and I was like, oh my gosh, how are you? How's your sister? Da, 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 da. How's she doing? She was like, yeah, she's cool. And I was like, give her my number and tell her to call me so I can invite her to church. So she was like, all right, cool. So she gave her sister her number and, you know, she did actually call me um, and we spoke on the phone and I was just talking to her about, the, you know, the whole situation with, you know, my ex-husband's friend. And I was just like, I'm like, I'm really sorry about what happened or whatever, but like, it's cool at the end of the day, like no man can give you value. Imagine I'm giving someone advice, put your trust in Christ, you know, come to Christ first, you know, get involved in the church. And eventually you'll find someone who's like truly for you, you'll find someone who truly loves you for you or whatever. So she started coming to the church with us and bearing in mind that, you know, because she came as, you know, my friend, you know, she was the only person that she only knew me and my husband. She didn't know anybody else in the church. And so when she started coming and she started coming regularly, she would always be with me and my husband. There was, there was nobody else that she really knew. Also, because we started to, you know, we started to form a really, really close relationship to the point where, you know, I'd be talking to her all the time. She'd be at our house literally all the time. And, you know, we just became really, really tight. And then it started to kind of just shift a little bit where, you know, even though she was like my friend and, you know, we had become really close and really tight, I started to notice that, you know, now my husband had her number and that sometimes she wouldn't call me, but she would call him or she wouldn't message me and she would message him and it'd be like, oh yeah, you know, um, then he said she's coming around today. And I'm like, huh, but why didn't she just message me that? And these were the little things that I started to notice. And then, you know, it got to the point where um, at this time I was working at Ted Baker, which was really far because the head office is in Camden. It took like an hour and a bit to get home. So I would get home and this girl would be at my house. And it happened once, happened twice. And I remember just pulling my husband to the side and I was just like, what's going on? Like, this is really off key. Like based on the, um, the mindset of, you know, the church that we were in and the sort of rules and like boundaries that they had, like if you weren't married to somebody, the general consensus was that you shouldn't be alone with a woman that's not your wife. And so for, for this girl to be in my house when I wasn't there was a bit triggering for me. Like if this isn't something that we were supposed to do when we were dating, why is this girl in my house sort of thing? But I think maybe in his mind he thought that because my son was there, um, it's like that was the accountability because they weren't fully on their own. But I just thought that was really off key because like I said, as far as I was concerned, this was my friend and there's no reason for her to be coming to our home if I am not there. So I, I pulled him to the side and I spoke to him and I was like, no, this is really off key. I don't feel comfortable with this. Like, why is she coming to the house when I'm not here? I don't like it. So this just kind of needs to stop. But there were like, you know, there were other things that I started to see that, I, that started to make me really uncomfortable. So one day I spoke to him and I just said to him, look, this is like, I'm starting to get a vibe here. You know that she's wounded. Like she's really, she was really hurt by the situation. This is not something that she... You know she spoke to me about it was something that she spoke to my husband about and it was also something that she would you know she would tell other people in the church as she started to get to know people you know everybody kind of came became familiar with the fact that she used to be with my with my ex-husband's friend and he'd broken her heart and all of this it was something that she used to talk about all the time and so i just said to him look as a woman i'm telling i'm speaking to you from a woman's perspective if i've been in a relationship and i've been really hurt by somebody and then i'm getting you know male attention from somebody else whether that male attention is is directed towards me in a romantic way i'm going to start to develop feelings for that person and so i said to him like the way she's talking to you is giving me the impression that she's in like she's she's falling for you like emotionally and so like word of advice just just cut her off like i don't feel comfortable with this if she messages you just tell her to message me and if she's saying she wants to come to the house tell her to wait till i'm back like just the same conversation that we had before and when i look back on this situation i feel like this was at the beginning of the end because like i said in the beginning for me my husband was my person i i shouldn't have felt like there was anything that i could tell him that I shouldn't be able to tell him. I, there was nothing, there should have been nothing that I should be able to communicate to him that he wouldn't be able to receive and understand. But when I look back, I'm dealing with somebody who, 
from experience already had an issue with boundaries and knowing how to around women and so i feel like looking back me telling him you know i feel like this girl's developing feelings for you it was almost like oh, his radar went on and he even started to see her differently but anyway fast forward a little bit um i got pregnant around this time with our first child and you know um you know whilst i was pregnant and we were getting ready to you know have the baby i was going through all of this drama you know to do with our housing and we ended up moving into another property but it was literally like literally a couple of weeks before my my son was due to be born and so we moved into this flat it was a mess like they left it in a huge mess and so we had a lot to do um in terms of like getting the flooring down getting painting down like getting furniture and all of this stuff just to make the place you know appropriate for you know our son's arrival and whatever and i couldn't paint because you know how like fumes are and whatever it wasn't really safe for me to be pregnant and painting and so he was like you know what i'll get it done i'll get the painting done and he was going to get another one of our friends to help us or whatever so one day we were at the house and he was getting ready to paint the house with you know one of our friends and then she turned up at the house and it was late it was probably like 11 o'clock and i was just like um why is she here sort of thing bearing in mind the conversation i'd had with him before about her being around when i'm not there he knew that I was going back to our other home because we had like a period of time where we were still staying there and we had time to fix this place up until we had to give the keys back. But I was just like, why is she Why is she here? I pulled him aside. I was like, why, what is she doing here? It's 11 o'clock. Like, she shouldn't be here. Who invited her here? He was like, oh yeah, basically she said that she wanted to help us paint. And I was just like, but this isn't appropriate. I spoke to you about this already. And he was like, no, it's cool. You know, Finny's here. Like, our friend is here. So we're not on our own. Da -da 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 -da. And I wasn't happy about this again, but I was like, okay, cool. I'm just going to leave it. I'm just going to go home. Didn't think nothing of it. So anyway, we've moved into our new place now. Um, I've had my son. Everything seems to be going well. Um, she, she's still spending as much time as she used to spend. She was out of house pretty much every single day, you know, spending time with us every day. But like I said, I could feel the shift kind of happening where whereas we used to talk every day we used to talk all the time even though we were still close i felt like she was developing a stronger friendship with my husband where they were talking all the time and so there was a particular um incident and this is the first of you know the the major incidents that happened between this um, particular female i'm going to call her the plus one particular incident where i was having a, a fellowship in the evening with a lot of the sisters from the church you know to talk about you know the bible we're doing like a bible study a personal bible study and I'd invited, you know, women from the church to come down. Obviously, she was one of them. But she texted me. She said that she was going to come to the house earlier so she could chill with us before everybody else came. And I was like, all right, cool, that's fine. So she comes to the house. And as I was cooking and getting ready for the fellowship later on, I realised that I'd forgotten some stuff from Asda. And at this point, where we lived was literally like a stone's throw away from Asda. You could literally walk to Asda from our house in less than 10 minutes. It was literally down the road. So I was like, oh my gosh, like to my husband, I forgot like this or whatever. Like, do you mind just running to Asda to like run into Asda for me to get like whatever it is that I needed? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I'll go get it. So she was like, yeah, yeah, I'll drop, I'll, I'll drop you, I'll drop you. So based on all of the conversations that I had with my ex-husband about, you know, the fact that I didn't feel comfortable with him being around this girl on his own, I was expecting him to be like, no, it's cool. Like, you don't need to drop me. I'll just walk because literally it was down the road. But he was like, no, no, no. Like, all right, cool. Let's go. And I was literally, when I say I was so angry, but I didn't know, I didn't say anything in that moment. I just kept it to myself. But internally, I was literally boiling with rage because I was just like, how can I have, you know, multiple conversations with you about this female and the way that she's moving around you and you think it's okay to go to Asda with her alone and don't get me wrong i'm not saying that you know it was a big issue but it's just the principle that i've communicated something to you instead of you making me feel safe by you know kind of honoring what i've said you're you're still kind of continuing this this sort of friendship relationship that's making me uncomfortable so anyway let's just say this was around 1 2 p.m that that they said that they were going to asda it should have taken them like less than half an hour to literally just drive to like i said was down the road drive to Asda, pick up what I asked for and come back. It should have taken half an hour, 40 minutes max. So one o'clock, they left the house. Two o'clock, they went back. Three o'clock, they went back. Four o'clock, they went back. Five o'clock, they went back. At this point, I cannot even begin to describe to you the emotions that were going through me at this time. Angry, I don't think even cuts it. So I started calling him. He wasn't picking up his phone. I was calling her. She wasn't picking up her phone calling him, calling her, no one's picking up their phone. So I was like, you know what? Let's just wait and see what happens. Six o'clock comes, 
at this point the fellowship's starting because I think I invite people to come round about six or seven o'clock. And so people start to come to the house, you know, I'd cook the majority of the food or whatever I had or whatever. And so people were like, oh cool, like let's get started, blah, blah, blah. Where's this female? Because obviously everybody knew she would be there. And the embarrassment that I felt when people were like, oh, where is she? And me having to say, oh, I sent them to Asda to go get something. I'm waiting for them to come back. Not being able to like make it plain that they went to Asda at 1 p.m. It's now six, seven o'clock and they're not here. It was embarrassing. And even, you know, when people arrived, they didn't get back to the house until about eight, nine o'clock. It was really late. So at this point, they'd been gone for about seven hours, seven, eight hours. And when they came back, the first thing I noticed was that she was wearing a completely different set of clothes. So what she left my house wearing, she wasn't wearing the same clothes when she came back. It's like this idea, like I said, like, like Candice was saying in the beginning, this idea of, you know, being the bigger person. And obviously it, at this time, I was seen as someone who was quite prominent in the church in terms of, you know, my standing and how, you know, people respected me. So I couldn't be seen to be out of control. I had to kind of hold it down and just kind of treat her like amicably until I got to the point where I was able to have this discussion with my husband as to what the hell went on. So she came in the house and I was literally so livid. Like I didn't even know what to do or what to say. I was barely able to function like with what was going on inside the house. But when he came in the house, he was like, oh, surprise, babe. He was like, oh, babe, I got you a camera. Like, oh, surprise. And because of, you know, what was going through my head, I couldn't even really like receive the gift properly. I was kind of just like, thank you. It, it just wasn't added. Nothing was making sense. Anyway, I think I put the camera to one side and I just carried on with the fellowship or whatever. I just trying to, you know, get my head into, okay, cool. You invited these women around to do a Bible study. Just get on with the Bible study. So we're doing the Bible study, we're talking about, you know, end times and all this. I told you, like, when I was a Christian, I was obsessed with end times. But anyway, so we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about end times, doing all this, these things, talking about, like, the different nations that the Bible talks about and whatever. And then someone was like, oh, where's, where's, the, where's, you know, plus one? Because she wasn't in the room anymore. And I didn't even notice that she'd left the room. So I'm like, oh, wow, where is she? And, you know, with the way our flat was set up, you know, everything in the flat was upstairs on, you know, the first level but our bedroom was downstairs. It was like a split level flat. So you come in the door, you know, all the bedrooms, the bathroom, the kitchen was all on one floor. And then you went down, you know, a flight of stairs and it was literally just our room down there. So I went into the kitchen, they're not in the kitchen. And I went down into my bedroom and I'm seeing, you know, plus one on the bed with my ex-husband, just chilling on the bed playing cards. At this point, I couldn't, I couldn't really contain the emotions anymore. I was so angry. I was just like, what is this girl doing in my room on my bed like you know when like somebody is literally crossed every boundary imaginable I think I went upstairs and I probably like carried on for about half an hour and I was just like you know what I think everybody should go home it's getting late like can everybody just go because I literally just couldn't even process what was happening so eventually everybody left the house and I remember going to my husband and I was just like what the hell happened today like what the hell happened why did you take so long to go and get something I asked you to get from Asda and take seven hours to bring it back. And then when you do come back, this chick is wearing a different set of clothes. And he had all the excuses under the sun. Yeah, basically when we left the house, I was like, yeah, I want to get Joe a camera. I want to surprise her. And so we went to, you know, Curry's in Wandsworth and we were doing this and that. Well, they had us sitting there for ages and they, you know, they were talking us through the different cameras and they told us that, you know, we, they had the body of this, but we, they didn't have the lens. And so we went to Brixton and then we did this and he was just giving me a whole, you know, this, this whole account of, you know, why even just getting a camera had taken seven hours for them to go and come back. Deep down inside, I didn't believe a word that he was saying, but it was like I didn't know what else to think. Bearing in mind that this was not the first time that, you know, there'd been an issue with another female. Like, like I said, prior to, you know, um, us being married, he'd had this incident or this issue with these two girls. There was another incident even prior to that around, you know, Valentine's, when he'd been talking to another female in his Depop inbox you know, after trying to get me a pair of shoes. So he, I had told him that I wanted a pair of like, you know, those um, knee-high Timberlands. And so he'd gone on Depop 
to go and find these knee high Timberlands and realise that there was a girl that he knew, you know, I think from school or from, you know, from back in the day on the Depop selling the same boots that I wanted. And so in talking to her about, you know, where to meet up with her to get the shoes, it turned into now I want to meet up with you because I want to see you. I want to, you know, I want to spend time with you. And again, those are messages that I found in February, which, which would have been literally three months after we got married. And so I've already seen this pattern of behavior. And so when this incident happened with this plus one, everything in me knew he was lying to me. Everything in me knew he was lying. My intuition was telling me he was lying, but we just had a baby. And I was just like, okay, cool. I'm gonna have a conversation with her tomorrow. And I'm gonna tell her about herself because this is like, it's out of order on so many levels. But I'm warning you, I do not want you to speak to this girl again. Like I've, I've, I've spoken to you, I've told you how I felt. You've ignored everything I've said. Now, I'm, I, I do not want you to speak to this girl again. I don't. I delete her number out of your phone. You two do not have a friendship. Your friendship is dead. And so I'd spoken to my pastor about this situation as well. And he was just, just as confused as me, just as, as baffled as me. And he was like, I think I need to have a word with her. And I was like, nah, she's supposed to be my close friend. Like at this point, like I said, you know, despite all of the, um, the conversations that I'd had privately with my husband, me and her were still really close. We used to talk all the time. And like I said, she was out of house all the time. So I was like, no, I want to speak to her because it doesn't make sense for us to be this close. And I can't even tell her when she's done something wrong. Like I'm going to speak to her myself. So the next day, Sunday was church. I pulled her to the side and I was like, um, what happened yesterday was off key. First of all, you've gone out with my husband and you spent all the day outside. Then you come back wearing different changes of clothes. Didn't make no sense. The story around that whole thing didn't make sense. And then thirdly, you're chilling in my bed, playing cards in my room. I was like, this has got to a point where I don't, I don't feel comfortable with this. And this is the first time that I'd actually addressed her personally about, you know, the sort of friendship that she had with my husband was just inappropriate. And as I was talking to her, she was like, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to accuse me of? And I was like, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just saying that as your friend, I don't feel comfortable with the relationship that you have with my husband. And I, I just want you to cut it off because you've crossed too many boundaries. If you were married, there is no way I would come to your house and be comfortable sitting on your bed that you share with your husband. It just doesn't make sense. And I just said to her, like, I just don't feel comfortable with it. And so you know, just out of respect for me and our friendship, I don't want you to talk to my husband anymore. She was like, all right, cool. But from that day, she she cut me off. She literally did not speak to me again. Like I would say hello to her and she would ignore me. She literally didn't speak to me. And I was just like, rah, I'm not the one in the wrong. And yet you're having a grievance with me. I was just like, all right, cool. And I didn't hear anything. Nothing really came up again. It was like, okay, you've, I'm, she made it clear that she didn't want anything to do with me. And at this point, I was under the impression that her and my husband had cut off their relationship as well. And so we were just kind of going through, you know, the motions in the same church where she, she was still there. And at this point, she'd been there for months now, maybe even a year. Um, so she had her own friends now. If I miss this point, I just want to make it clear. When me and my husband had our first child, she was actually there. She was the first person that came to the hospital when my son was born. And this is how close we were. So I literally had my son. And her and my sister were the first people that came to the hospital to see me after I gave birth. Um, so anyway, fast forward a little bit. Um, around this time, like I've, I've spoken about this on my platform many times, that my son used to have like these crazy seizures. We didn't have a real explanation as to why he used to have these seizures, but they used to happen quite frequently. And, um, you know, at this point I was pregnant again. I was expecting my second child with my husband. So all this time, you know, from the time of this incident up until this time, I hadn't spoken to this girl. I hadn't spoken to this plus one. Um, we just basically wasn't friends anymore, but you know, the type of person that I am, I'm not the type of person that can be, you know, around certain people and not, and just not speak to them. It, it just irks me. Like I said, I feel comfortable when it comes to conflict, when it comes to like dysfunction in relationships, I'd rather just everybody be cool. And so like halfway through the pregnancy, I just started to feel really like, um, isolated and alone, especially because, you know, during this period of time, I'd also fallen out with with one of my best friends at the time. Um, I wasn't talking to her anymore. And even that was a grieving process for me because, you know, me and this other girl who, like I said, was my best friend at the time, like we were so close that when we weren't talking anymore, I felt like I'd lost almost a part of me. And it's, it's not to say that I didn't have friends, but I mean, people that I was literally with every day, like all the time, I just felt a bit alone. 
So I basically spoke to one of the older sisters in the church and I'm like, oh, I'm going to reach out to her and speak to her because I just want to squash this issue. Like there shouldn't be any like animosity between us, blah, 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 blah. I basically reached out to her and said to her that I wanted to meet up with her so we could talk. So we met up, she picked me up or whatever, we was talking in the car. And I was just basically asking her, like, what's the issue? Like, why is it that you haven't spoken to me for X amount of time? Like, what's the problem? And she basically was like, I just felt really offended, you know, by what you by what you said to me. You know, I felt like you were accusing me of doing something. And, you know, I just felt like the, the sort of relationship that we had, the closeness that we had, and the fact that you would you would kind of talk to me like I was doing something behind your back really hurt me. You know, when I was growing up, people always used to accuse me of stealing their man or, you know, doing stuff with their boyfriend. And that's why I find it difficult to have friendships with girls. I just felt like you were basically taking me back to what I was experiencing before. And I just thought, you know what, I can't be bothered this long. And, you know, during this conversation, she was being really aggressive and like really, you know, like chesty. Do you get what I mean? And I, in my mind, I was just thinking... Personally, I hadn't done anything wrong. Like me telling you, and I said this to her as well, like me telling you that I don't feel comfortable with the relationship that you have with my husband is not is not wrong. And I don't take any of that stuff back because you did cross boundaries. You did do things that I would never do to you. Even if we weren't in a church setting, there's certain boundaries that you don't cross. And so we were just going back and forth, back and forth. And then eventually she was like, you know what? Okay, cool, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I upset you, I'm sorry I hurt you. And I was like, all right, cool. I'm sorry if my delivery made you feel like I was accusing you of something instead of like just advising you as to how I felt. So anyway, we hugged it out and you know, we were both crying or whatever, um, just getting emotional. She was just like, oh, I just feel like I've missed out on so much. That like, obviously I'm having another baby now. How's your pregnancy been? And you know, during this time, she also lost her grandma who she used to live with. And so she was telling me about how, you know, she was feeling about losing her grandma. We we're just catching up, we we're talking in the car for hours. So eventually, you know, we hugged it out again and, you know, we both apologised to each other and I went upstairs to my husband and I just told him that, right, I met up with the girl, the plus one, and we've kind of squashed our differences, like we're not beefing anymore, not that it was beef, but you get what I mean, we're not upset with each other anymore, we've, we've kind of talked it out and everything's good, but just going forward, this friendship is between me and her and I still do not want you to get involved with her at all, like don't talk to her and you know just just keep it like out of respect for me i don't want you to talk to her and he was like all right cool it's fine so i think a week later or week it was like within two weeks of this conversation with me and the plus one my son had a seizure and we, um, we ended up in hospital with him for like a couple of days i believe and so we came out of hospital um and then my husband just started going to the gym like he would say he's going to the gym and um he would go at like these really crazy hours like he would go to the gym and like leave the house at like 10 11 o'clock so i asked him like why are you going to the gym so late he'll be like oh yeah because the gym's quiet at oh, night time no one's there whatever whatever 24 hours gym whatever and i was like okay cool but again now like, my intuition started speaking to me something was off something wasn't right so anyway, this particular evening, um, as I said, at this moment, I'm pregnant with my daughter. I was about seven months at this time, probably six, six to between five and seven months. He'd gone to the gym um, around 10, 11. He didn't come back till like three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning. When he came back from the gym, I was awake because I couldn't really sleep properly knowing that he was out. So when I heard him come back in the house, I just thought that, you know, he's going to shower and come back to bed or he's going to come to the bed. But he didn't he just stayed upstairs which i found really odd and you know you know when you've been with someone for you know a length of time you kind of know within yourself you know their patterns of behaviors you kind of know when something's off and when something's not right and something in me just knew that something was off so i went upstairs and you know based on what i've already communicated to you guys already about his behaviors and his pattern of behaviors i knew that he was up to something i just didn't know what it was and so I asked him, like, I, I was sat down next to him, was playing PlayStation, and I was like, oh, is everything all right? He was like, yeah, everything's good. I was like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, everything's fine. I was like, are you hungry? He's like, yeah. I was like, okay, cool. I went and made him a sandwich, got him a drink, or whatever. Sat down next to him, and I was like, are you sure everything's good? He's like, yeah. Then I just said to him, I'm going to be honest with you. I feel like you're up to something, that you're doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. Like, everything in me is screaming at me that something is off. And rather than me find out that you're doing something behind my back as i found you know before previous times before i'd rather you just tell me like i'm not happy in our marriage or you know this is what's going on but i'd rather you tell me to my face that that you're doing something and rather me find out that you're doing something he was like no i'm not doing nothing there's nothing like i don't have anything to hide from you there's nothing there's nothing and i was like right, cool gave him a kiss and went to my bed when i woke up in the morning like i said i couldn't sleep properly i woke up in the morning and i took his phone 
and I basically opened his phone and just started looking through all of his messages and I couldn't find anything. Couldn't find anything in his messages, couldn't find anything like that was untoward. But at this time, this was around, you know, the time that Snapchat became popular. So I opened up his Snapchat and I did not know how to use this damn thing. I was like, what, how does this even work? Because I didn't have Snapchat, I never had it. So I was just going through the app, like trying to figure out how it worked. And I think I even had to go into Google to find out how to get into Snapchat messages. But eventually I felt, realized how to do it. And literally when I went into the Snapchat messages, the plus one's name was the first name that came up on the Snapchat. Bearing in mind that for the last six months to a year, I didn't even know that they were even in communication. But when I opened the chat, they were having this big boy conversation and basically he'd gone to the gym at night to have a conversation with her and she, it looked like she had fallen asleep. So he was like, oh, I'm here, I'm at the gym. Where are you? Are you awake? Da, 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 da. You better not fall asleep. You made me come all the way here just to talk to you. You're not even awake. Just going on and on and on, like almost like a desperation in his messages. Then eventually he was like, I really need to tell you something. Make that like, get up. And she didn't, she didn't reply. But when I was going through the messages, like going back, the conversation started, you know, at the time that my son was in hospital, um, a cut, like two weeks prior. And this was literally just at the time that I had this conversation with her about not talking to my husband and, you know, us kind of like repairing our relationship. So I'm thinking she had messaged him and been like, oh, how's Israel? You know, I heard he had a seizure, I, like I seen that he'd had a seizure. I just wanted to find out how he was doing. And then from that conversation, it just escalated into now we're, we're having secret conversations at the gym. So in my mind, whereas before, you know, all the incidents that had happened before, it seemed to me like she was oblivious, like, you know, kind of like ditzy. Oh, I didn't know what I was doing was wrong. Now it was obvious to me that this was calculated because after we'd had that conversation in the car, we were like, okay, cool. These are the boundaries. I don't feel comfortable with you having a close relationship with my husband. It's just not right. Instead of her to message me, bearing in mind that we'd, we'd repaired our relationship and we were cool and we were talking, she could have messaged me and been like, oh, how's Israel? But she messaged him on Snapchat and now they're having secret conversations behind my back. Honestly, words cannot even begin to describe to you how I felt in that moment. I literally felt sick to my stomach because now I was not only being lied to by her, but I was being lied to by my husband as well. And I just didn't even know how to feel. I didn't know how to process what I was seeing and like I said the desperation in those messages that like, oh, I really need to talk to you I just got the feeling that he wanted to tell her how he felt about her that's the that's the vibe that I was getting from the messages but bearing in mind I'm carrying this man's child when I tell you at that moment it was almost as if I did like I was literally in my mind praying that I would lose the baby that I was carrying because I didn't want to have a baby again for somebody that I couldn't trust. It was almost like I was now very aware that no matter where we got to in our quote unquote happiness or wherever we got to in our marriage and our relationship, that he would never be faithful to me. And that was a revelation I got clearly too late. So anyway, he wakes up and I confronted him with these messages. And again, it's the same old story. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do this. Why were you messaging her? Oh, I wanted to talk to her about, you know, my best friend. Like, hold on. The best friend that she used to date two years ago. The best friend that's moved on with another female for the last two years. What exactly do you need to talk about? What do you need to talk to her about him when she's been in the church for the last year or two years? Like it just, nothing he was saying was making sense. So I spoke to my pastor and I was just like, this is what's going on. You know, they're talking behind my back again or whatever, whatever. So he's come to our house now and he's talking to him and he's just like, what's going on? Like, what's actually going on? And he didn't really have much to say. Like I said, it was the same old rubbish. Like, oh, I don't know. I just, you know, I know it wasn't right, but I did it anyway. But you know, I, I, I wanna be married. I, I, want, I want my wife. I want my children. I want this, I want this, I want that. And um, he, he basically just had this long lecture with him about, you know, boundaries, you know, getting a job, making sure that he was doing something. So he's not kind of wasting idle time, finding himself involved in things that he shouldn't be because he's actually busy doing something. So anyway, I would say that from this point onwards, that was when my heart was really, really broken. Like, despite the fact that I continued in a marriage with him, at this point onwards, the trust was gone. I didn't trust him anymore. And, you know, like I said, at this point, I, I, I knew 
that I should have exited the marriage a long time ago. Like I shouldn't have married him in the first place. But now that I was in it and now I was carrying a second child for him, it was just like I felt stuck. And so the fact that everything was kind of glossed over, like, oh yeah, I've had a conversation with, with your husband, okay, I've had a conversation with the girl. Because at this point I was like, I cannot speak to her. If I speak to her, I'm literally, there's nothing for me to say to her at this point. I've spoken to her and she'd come across like all of this stuff was innocent. But now that she'd messaged my husband behind my back, it's calculated. There's nothing for me to say. And so, you know, at this point, again, I feel like this should have been the point where she should have been removed from the church altogether. Because how are you now, you know, speaking to people's husband behind their back with the intention of, you know, meeting up with them and doing all sorts of madness. And you're still able to go to the same church. But she did. And so, again, in my mind... Even though, you know, this was another glaring, you know, red flag in my face. I just went back to normal and she was still in the church, but I was under the impression that, you know, it was, it was locked off and there was nothing going on between them. So fast forward a few years, I've had my second daughter. And, you know, at this point, we'd, we'd gone through like various moves in terms of our housing. We had various issues. This is when, you know, my skin had gone completely crazy. Like literally, as soon as I had my daughter, my skin went crazy. And that's when I had like my first, I had my first stint with the, the whole eczema experience. And so I was literally covered head to toe in eczema. I was, I was really, really going through it. I don't need to go through the whole thing because you guys saw it, you, you know what I went through. And it was, it was really traumatic for me having to, you know, kind of handle a newborn baby, a toddler, because like I said, my, my daughter and my son were like basically a year apart and have to deal with this chronic skin issue at the same time. And, you know, my husband was extremely supportive. I would never take that away from him. You know, during the time I was dealing with these skin issues, he never made me feel like, you know, I was ugly. He never made me feel like disgusted of me, disgusted about how my skin looked. He was, he was super supportive. You know, he was always reassuring. You know, he would always encourage me um, to sleep next to him, even though at this point I was now sleeping in the, um, the, the sitting room because I just didn't, want to be in the same bed with him and you know getting up and seeing all of these skin flakes in the bed i just thought i just felt so insecure that like i just wouldn't sleep it with him or next to him but even he was like no sleep like sleep with me like he told me basically to sleep inside a bed sheet like you know like a, a duvet cover basically sleep inside the duvet cover next to him so my skin flakes that were um, shedding would, would essentially be caught inside the um, inside the duvet sheet instead of kind of in the bed where he was. And I would never take that away from him. He was extremely supportive. Um, but yeah, so fast forward a couple of years, we got to this point in our marriage where we were not getting on at all. Like there were so many issues that were coming up. And one of the other issues that was really grinding me was the fact that, um, you know, besides the issues that we had with this plus one in the past, he also had maintained a very, very close relationship with my ex-best friend as well. So this girl I was no longer talking to, she had violated me in many ways prior to us not talking. And she had violated me in ways that my husband was very aware of. Um, she's also, you know, someone who I consider a YouTuber. And at the time she had actually made a video um, on her YouTube channel talking about how, you know, someone that was close to her or used to be close to her had written a letter um, to her that you know really hurt her and upset her to the point where she miscarried a child and everybody knew that she was talking about me but what didn't make sense to me was the fact that she's you know been very vocal about the fact that she struggled to have children with her husband but at no point in this you know this experience that she she talks about did she ever get a pregnancy test to confirm this pregnancy she when she claims that she had this miscarriage she never went to a doctor or to a hospital to confirm that the the miscarriage was completely evacuated all of this was like mental speculation i believed i was pregnant and i believed i had a miscarriage and in this whole video she blamed it on me my husband knew all of that and i remember even you know speaking to my pastor about it and being like how can this how can this girl make a whole video about me you know and, and claim a pregnancy that was never confirmed did anybody ask her if she did a pregnancy test and she didn't so like I said, my husband knew about all of this, like the way this girl treated me was so extremely toxic. And you know, this was another example of, you know, someone I'd been in close relationship with that had violated me on many way, in many ways, 
in many degrees and I literally just kind of like been the bigger person and not said anything or not done anything so at this point her and my husband were in really like we're in a really close like friendship and in my head I was just like how can me and you be married you're supposed to be my bona fide you're supposed to be my confidant you're supposed to be like essentially like my counterpart my com my my companion you somehow are able to maintain a tight relationship with someone that you know hates me and I'm using the word hate specifically for a reason he knew that I hadn't actually done anything to warrant the level of hatred this girl was displaying towards me so to have a close relationship with her didn't make any sense but anyway like I said our marriage was literally on the rocks at this point we weren't getting on you know this was one of the issues that we were having but we just were not seeing eye to eye so that year we had marriage retreat. Prior to us going away for marriage retreat that year, it was his birthday. But even on his birthday, we weren't talking and everybody could see it. Like we were literally not getting on. I came to his birthday late. I didn't even want to be there to be fair. I don't think I was even going to go. It was only because, you know, again, I'd spoken to one of the older sisters in the church and they were like, you can't not go to your husband's birthday party sort of thing, so just go. So I came, but I was not happy. You could tell I didn't want to be there. I didn't even say a word to him. Like there was no conversation whatsoever. So, you know, fast forward, I think a week or two later, we'd gone to marriage retreat and it was the same, it was the same thing. I don't think we'd spoken to each other for weeks. So when we got there, you know, him and my best best friend were like kikiing and, you know, laughing and joking with each other. And we literally were not speaking. I remember just feeling to myself, like, what have I got myself into? Like, I was so unhappy and I just wanted out at this point. So the marriage retreat is probably about two days long. First and second day, we literally didn't speak at all. We were going through the sermons and whatever. And, you know, he was he was there, you know, bantering with this girl and um, just... We, we just didn't talk so we got to the end of, like kind of like the end of the retreat now and at this point you get like another like evening and, and half a day to kind of like spend together and it just we hadn't spoken for the whole thing and so we got upstairs to our room and i remember just coming to him he was playing the playstation and i was just like first of all why did you bring a playstation here second of all why did you bring your friends here because he'd invited his friends to come all the way down we were all the way in like I can't remember where it was, but it was like a two hour drive from London. You invited your friends to come all the way here. Why did you bring me here? Why did you pay for us to go to marriage retreat when you had absolutely no intention of actually working on our marriage? And I remember breaking down in literal tears, like crying my eyes out, trying to understand why, you know, this person would go out of their way to date me, to marry me, and to violate me time and time and again and make me feel like I was worth nothing. And I said to him, everything in me is telling me that you're involved with someone else the same way I felt like you were involved with someone else before. Every time I've had an inkling about you talking to someone behind my back, you've been talking to someone. And, you know, I'm making this video talking about one specific person who was this plus one. But there were other incidences where I would find him talking to other girls behind my back. It was not the first time. She was not the only female. And so he was like, no, it's not that. And, you know, he, he kind of like tried to reassure me, he hugged me and he like apologised and he was like, I'm so sorry for how I've made you feel. I'm so sorry for, you know, violating your trust in all of these different instances. I know that I have a problem. I know that I have an issue, but I'm going to make it right. I'm going to do everything I can to get your trust back. And I was like, honestly, I want you to tell me now because I feel like something's already happened. If there's anything that you've already done, this is the time to tell me. We're at marriage retreat. You know, I'm able to take whatever it is that you want to say. If you've actually done something with someone, just tell me now and we'll deal with it right now. He was like, I swear I haven't done anything. I have not done nothing with no one. You know, I'm here. I'm, I'm with you. We're going to make our marriage work. I love you. We're going to be together. And I was like, all right, cool. Hugged it out and then spent the rest of the marriage retreat just enjoying each other's company and just getting on with everybody else. It was in July. August, September, my birthday came round and... Um, you know, things weren't great, but you, I knew that something was just a bit off key. I just couldn't put my finger on it. Um, so like I said, my birthday came round and that day, the plus one, bearing in mind, I have not spoken to this girl for about two years since that last incident where, you know, she had messaged, she'd been messaging my husband behind my back on Snapchat. I had not spoken to her again, but over time, because we were still in the same church, it wasn't the same animosity that I had before. I kind of like softened a bit. So even though I didn't speak to her and I had no intention of being her friend again, I would speak to her if I saw her. So if I saw her, I would hug her and be like, oh, you're right. How are you? Da, 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 and keep it moving. So we were amicable on those terms. So 
we hadn't actually spoken to each other directly. I hadn't, you know, messaged each other, not spoken to each other, you know, on the phone, nothing. But on my birthday, she texted me saying happy birthday. I know you a screenshot of the message that she sent me. And even in this message, you can see that we hadn't had any communication because from the time that I had cut her off, I deleted her messages and I hadn't spoken to her, but she had messaged, she'd gone out of her way to text me and wish me a happy birthday on my birthday of 2019. So just to give it some context, just go all the way back. We got married in 2014, November 2014. The following year, 2016, February 2016, my son was born. And that was around the time that that whole camera incident happened. Then I got pregnant with my daughter. 2017, that's when that incident happened when they were talking behind my back on Snapchat. We're now in 2019. Two weeks on from, you know, her sending me these messages, me and my husband's marriage was literally on the rocks. At this point, I was working at I was working at Netaporta, and at this point, at this point in my life, I was I was really happy because you know this was like my one of my dream jobs. I'd always like wanted to work for Netaporta. I'd always worked in the fashion industry, and Netaporta to me was like the creme de la creme of workplaces. My workplace was so dope. Like we had so many benefits. We had like our own work phone. Like just the vibe at work was amazing. I had all these dope friends. I, when I say I love my job, I loved my job. But at the same time, I was struggling. Like after a couple of months of being there, I was there for about, I think 10 or 11 months or so. Like towards the end, I was really struggling with my work because my marriage was so bad. I, was literally, I would literally go to work and be crying. We weren't talking. He was aggressive to me. He would talk to me anyhow. You know, he would, he would disrespect me. He would make me feel like absolute rubbish. Like I literally couldn't take it anymore. And I literally said to my pastor, you know, if we cannot resolve this in the next couple of weeks, I'm leaving this man. I don't want anything to do with him. I'm getting a divorce from this man. So he was just like, no, you know, take your time. We'll sort it out. But I was so depressed from this whole situation and I was struggling so much at work that I was actually put on a disciplinary because I wasn't functioning properly. I wasn't coming to work on time. Calling in work, I was calling into work sick all the time. And so I got, you know, called into a meeting and I had a disciplinary meeting where my manager was like, what's going on? You're not performing. We're gonna put you on this disciplinary. And I remember just breaking down in the office and just saying to them, look, like there's a lot going on in my housing. At the time, we were still moving around. I was having a lot of problems with my marriage and they were like, okay, cool. We understand, you know, this is going on, but you do realize that we have, you know, therapy, you know, as part of like your workplace benefits. And so we're gonna enroll you into therapy. We're gonna pay for all of your sessions and you know, everything's gonna be cool. And we'll see how it goes after that. And so I was like, okay, cool. And I was great. I was so grateful because I literally felt like I needed it. There were so many things that I was going through at the time. And I was also unpacking like a load of other trauma that I'd actually discussed and told my husband about at the time that I'd actually never spoken to anyone about. So yeah, so two weeks following, you know, this um, message that I received from her on my birthday, I was going through these therapy sessions that I was having every week and I remember being so broken that I couldn't even, you know, communicate to my therapist how I was actually feeling. Every time I'd go to a therapy session, I'd be crying like, uncontrollably for like the first 45 minutes and then I'll be able to speak for like 10 minutes and then the session would be over. And that's how the first sessions were kind of going. October, I remember just like it had got to the point where I was literally like ready to leave. I told my pastor, like literally, um, it was a Wednesday, I'll never forget it. It was a Wednesday and I literally messaged my pastor and I was like, I'm leaving. Like we will get ready to do a group fast with the church. So yeah, we're getting ready to do a group fast of the church that we used to do every year. We used to fast for three days every year. So I remember speaking to my pastor at the beginning of the fast and I said to him, like, I'm literally, I'm not doing this anymore. I didn't sign up for this. I feel like this man has violated me. And you know, he's done so many things to really like, really break my heart and destroy my self esteem to the point I'm not putting up with this marriage anymore. I'm not doing it. And so I said to him, um, I'm, doing the I'm doing the three day fast. At the end of the three day fast, um, I'm, that's literally that's all I'm gonna be praying and you know speaking to God about you know do I do I try and fix my marriage or do I just end it now and by the end of the three-day fast I'll come back to you and let you know what what decision I've made either we're, we're gonna work on the marriage or I'm, I'm getting a divorce and so my pastor was like all right cool so this was on a Wednesday um, this was on a, uh, a Wednesday so the fast started on the Wednesday and I remember being at work that day and he had texted me if I can find a message I'll put it up um, he texted me and he was like, can you pick up the kids and go to church with them? And I was like, what? like, no, because I'm going straight to church from work. Bearing in mind, at the time we were living in Putney, our church is in, um, was in Clapham Junction and I was working in Shepherd's Bush. 
So it didn't make any sense to me to go home to Putney and then make my way all to Cavan Junction when I can literally take a train from work to go straight to church. It didn't make sense to me. So I just said, no, bearing in mind, we weren't talking at this time. Like when I say we weren't talking, I mean, literally we weren't, we were not talking. And so for him to ask me to do him, like what seemed to me to be a favor going out of my way, I just said, no, I was like, no, I'm not doing it. So anyway, I came to church and then later on he came to church um, with the kids and you know, whatever else, I, I reiterated the same conversation I had to my pastor earlier on. And I think that same night, that same Wednesday, because of the conversation that I'd had with my pastor, he pulled him aside and spoken to him as well and been like, bro, like what's going on? Like your wife's literally ready to leave you. Your wife's literally ready to divorce you. What are you playing at sort of thing? So he apparently in this conversation, you know, when my, when my pastor relayed it back to me, my husband was basically saying, no, you know, he wants to be with me. He's going to make, he's going to do everything that he can to, you know, make it better. He's going to talk to me when he gets back home. He's going to, you know, try and make it right. All of this stuff, telling him everything that he wanted to hear. Got home. He didn't say a word to me. We just kind of scooted past each other. I had my lunch. I had my last um, my last meal before the fast was supposed to start on the Thursday, Friday, and then finish on Sunday. So I had my last meal and I went to bed. And I remember praying before I went to sleep, and I was just like, God, if there's anything that this man is doing behind my back, you need to expose it now because I cannot take this anymore. I refuse to live like this anymore. Went to sleep and I had a dream that essentially my husband was in an, was having an adulterous affair. I couldn't see the person's face properly, but I basically had like a vision of me going through my husband's phone and finding all of these messages confirming basically what I had thought. But you know when you have those dreams where it feels so real that when I wake up, I, when I woke up, I was confused. Like I thought what was what I was seeing in my dream was actually happening based on everything that I've just said. When I woke up, I was confused, like, what? I thought that was real. But when I woke up, one, I realised that my husband was next to me in the bed, which he doesn't usually sleep next to me. Basically, he had gone out. So when I got home after church, he had gone out. Um, so he, when I woke up, he was sleeping next to me. He, for a long time, he hadn't been sleeping next to me. He'd been sleeping in the, in the, in the sitting room. And sure, like literally, my husband would never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, leave his phone anywhere in my sight. Like I would never, he would never leave his phone around. I just never left his phone around me. And so when I woke up in the middle of the night after having this dream, when I saw him lying next to me, I was confused. I was like, rah, he's actually in the bed. And then I noticed that his phone was literally next to him as well. And I was like, that's even more odd because like I said, my husband never leaves his phone anywhere. Like him and his phone are attached to their hip. And when he goes to sleep at night, his phone is somewhere, I don't even know where it is, or it's literally like hidden somewhere. He, I, I just never have access to it. So the fact that his phone was there and the dream that I literally just had, again, it was instantaneous, like go and get his phone. So I picked up his phone. I remember getting out of the bed, opening his phone, and then um, going into his WhatsApp messages and finding conversations with, you know, a female on his WhatsApp, but it wasn't that deep. It was just like, why would you talk like that? But anyway. Then there was, um, again, going straight to Snapchat based on previous experience. Going into his Snapchat and finding another conversation that he's having with another girl, you know, wishing her a happy birthday, um, you know, telling her how amazing she is and how proud of her she is for, you know, going through her health challenges um, because she was also dealing with health challenges as well. Um, and in my head, I was like, on my birthday, like, I mean, two years in a row, he's barely wished me happy birthday. Like, I remember on my 30th birthday, I had a big, you know, um, dinner for my 30th. He never wished me happy birthday once that whole day. He didn't buy me a card. He didn't say a word to me. It was almost like it was just another day. And I remember even that day feeling so broken hearted that how can I be in a relationship, in a marriage with someone who doesn't even value me enough to say happy birthday? And that's how bad our relationship got. So when I'm talking about like, I was in an emotionally abusive relationship. I was in um, I was in a traumatic relationship. That's the kind of trauma I'm talking about because that emotional neglect is very difficult for somebody to process. Like imagine being married to someone and they don't even love or respect you enough just to say happy birthday. Like there was absolutely nothing. So I'm going through his phone, gone into Snapchat, he sent this girl, she actually had the same birthday as me. That's what made it worse. So he's messaged her on our, our birthday, how proud he is of her, but he didn't say nothing to me. He didn't buy me a car, didn't say nothing to me. And then I'm looking for all these messages, but in my head, I felt like that wasn't it. Like there was more than that. 
but I couldn't find anything else. So I've looked in the messages, I looked in the WhatsApp, looked in the Snapchat, and all I found was those messages that I just told you. But so I put the phone down and I went back to bed, and something was like, no, there's more, there's more, there's more. I, w I tried to go back to sleep and got the phone, and I was mem I remember sitting down next to the bed, just thinking to myself, like, what else is there to look at? I looked in his emails, I looked in literally everything I could possibly think of at the time and I couldn't find anything so I was literally like God like I don't know what it is that you're, you're, you've got me up here looking for, I don't know what to look for, I've looked at everything and almost like something dropped in my head, Facebook, I don't use Facebook, I never know my husband to use Facebook but something in me was like Facebook so I, I literally just, and I didn't even know you could do this at the time, but you can hide apps on your phone. So you can have an app on your phone and hide it from the main screen, but when you type it in, it will come up. So I couldn't, there was no Facebook app on his phone screen, but when I typed in Facebook into Siri, Facebook Messenger came up. And when I opened his Facebook messages, this plus one girl that I was under the impression had not spoken to my husband for nearly three years, was having a full-blown conversation with my husband. These were the messages that I saw. So at this time, my husband was running a food business out of my mum's house because my mum had essentially um, invested in, you know, getting him to start his own business. And so he was running this food, food like business out of my mum's house. People would order food and they'll come to my mum's house to pick it up. And so every week he would have to go to the meat market, which was in Spitalfields. And, you know, anyone that knows anything about meat market is open. I think it opens at like 12 a.m. and it's open till 6 a.m. So you literally have to go in the middle of the night to get your meat and fish. And so as I'm like going through these messages, you can see basically the sort of the sort of system that they had in order for them to meet up with each other and they basically like covered their whole relationship with this these meat market trips and then she says even though you've got the kids put the kids to bed early unless you're coming church and when i looked at the dates i realized that literally this conversation was from the night that he'd asked me to pick up the kids from work and bring them to church basically the night before so i was like so basically he'd wanted me to pick up the kids so he could not go to church, so him and this girl could meet up and go and shag each other. But because I didn't pick up the kids, he basically came to church with them and their plans basically got ruined, but they decided that they were going to meet up after church instead. He was like, okay, sleep. She's like, sleep, set your alarm. And he's like, I'm going to put the kids to bed at 8.30, da -da 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 -da, going on and on and on. Um, then she's like, meet me at Toot and Beck at the Common. He's like, what's there? Just a space to park the car. We can't go to prison. We need new places. And then he says, we need new places. In my head, I'm like, need new places to do what? And then it dawned on me what they were talking about. Then she says, where now? I'm going to leave soon. He's like, making a coffee. Then she goes, I was going to make one as well, but I'll just need to go to the toilet. They're going on and on. And then she's like, where are you? Where should I drive to? Then he's like, drive closer to me, drive closer to me. And then she's like, um, why don't we just go back to the prison, like the other end of the road? And then he goes, um, come Putney, which is where we lived at the time. We can beat next to the park entrance. And then she said Riverside, and he says, yeah. So at this point, I'm realizing that this is not the first rodeo. She's, she's been to my house before. She knows where we live. The fact that he can say, come Putney, we can beat next to the park, means that she knows where the park is. And this park is literally next door to my house. And then she says Riverside, meaning that she's been here before. So as I'm reading this, these messages, when I say that my heart literally shredded into a million pieces, I could not believe what I was reading. I screenshotted all the texts. I screenshotted all the texts that he sent to these other females as well. And I sent them straight to my pastor. And I was like, basically, I found what I'm looking for. I'm done. And then I woke him up and I just literally was like, get out of my house. Literally leave. I don't want you, I don't want you here. Da -da 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 -da. I can't believe you're sleeping with this girl behind my back. Of all the people in the world that you could be sleeping with, it had to be this plus one. She's not only your best friend's ex, but she's also the same female that messaged me two weeks prior wishing me a happy birthday. You're literally having sex with her in the park 
next to where we live. The same part that your kids play in during the day. Okay, we're back. As always, battery dies. Kids, yeah, but we're back. Picking up where we left off. So I found these messages in the phone. Obviously, you've done a good job of trying to hide them. And like I said, it was, it was at that point where I was literally crying out for something to change and I received what I needed to know in my dream. And before I even continue, I just want to make it very plain that one thing that people need to understand is women are literally the closest thing to God on earth. Even though mainstream religion has taught you that, you know, the Trinity is essentially free men and all of these things, they've literally stripped away the feminine principle because they don't want you to know how powerful you are how intuitive you are and how connected you are to the spirit. So yeah, so I've jumped up now. I've literally, like I've gone mad. Like this is not even like a reaction that I would normally have, but I was literally so, ang I just could not believe what my eyes were seeing. And the depravity of the messages, the fact that they had no care or concern for my kids. It was almost like they were disposable objects. Yeah, put them to bed. Um, I'm gonna put them to bed early so I can meet you, all of this stuff. I just found it so revolting. I literally woke him up and I was like, get up, get out, get your stuff and get out. I've seen the messages in your phone. I can't believe you're sleeping with this girl. He looked at me and his first response was, why are you going through my phone? Then he was like, I'm going back to sleep because it's not time for me to get off of work yet. And he just put the covers back over himself and just lied down. So I jumped up, literally, I was so angry. I pulled the covers off him and I was like, get out. So then eventually he gets up, but he's like, not moving. Like he's moving very slow. Like I'm shouting, I'm literally running and raving. And he's just looking at me like I'm crazy. And the look in his eyes were like so evil. It was almost as if I'd woken up to a stranger. Well, to be fair, it wasn't that far off because this is how he was behaving for the last couple of months anyway that led me to this depression in the first place. But it was just like another level, like he was literally taking the mick. He was taunting me like with everything that he was doing. Like I was packing his clothes and he was grabbing me like, don't touch my clothes. I didn't tell you to touch my clothes. Like just don't touch nothing. Don't do this, don't do that. And like by the time we finally got ready um, to leave the house, I tried to take the keys off him so he wouldn't be able to come back. And he literally wrestled me for the keys to the point where he hurt my hand. And then once I had like thrown his stuff out of the door and shut it, because he had taken the keys, after I'd locked the door and gone back inside, he'd opened the door again with the keys and been like, I've still got the keys. What are you gonna do about it? I can still come in the house. What are you gonna do about it? Like literally taunting me. And I just couldn't believe what was happening. You know, when you feel like you're in a dream. And I think that's the beginning of like my, trauma that's when the trauma i think really started and you know before i even continue i just wanted to like read a couple of like paragraphs from this book that i bought because you guys if you follow me <laughs> if you've been following me for a little while you've watched any of the videos that i've done before you would know that um when it comes to reading books like that's almost like my piece and so as soon as this thing happened i, I ordered it like a number of books and i was ordering books over time just to help me deal with what was going on and this is one of the books that i bought but basically once he had left, I'd called my pastor and kind of like explained the whole situation to him. But I literally just couldn't believe what was happening. So I called in sick to work. I was supposed to be at work that day myself. I called in sick to work and I was like, I can't come in today. Something's happened, blah, 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 blah. And then it was the weekend, so I didn't have to go back in the following, till the following week. Um, but it was just, the whole thing was really just a whirlwind. And, you know, my, like my pastor came down, you know, with his wife and we waited at my house until he finished work. And then they kind of like had said to me like write down everything that you want to say and then when he comes back you can question him and ask him about all these messages and ask him about what's going on so that's what I did when he came back from work we sat down and I was going through these questions I probably still got them in my phone but you know just for sake of time I'm not going to read it out the answers that he was giving me to these questions were not making sense like for example I've put I, obviously I put the messages up so you can see them yourself you know whenever they would say something um, mistakenly or make a typo both of them would correct it but when I asked him, what did you mean when you said, let's be in the park? He was like, he meant to say me. She didn't correct it and he didn't correct it because they just knew what each other meant. But I was like, in your whole thread, you're making hella mistakes and you're correcting it. But the very thing that you would probably, as a married man, not want someone to mistake what you're saying for something else is what you didn't correct. It was just a whole load of bull. And so he was chatting all of this rubbish, just kind of whatever, whatever. And I was like, I don't care what you have to say. I don't want you here. I want you out. And so um, my pastor was like, yeah, like, bro, like, you're gonna have to leave your house. 
um, you know, like, I don't know where you want to go, like, blah, 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 but you're going to have to leave, you can't, you can't stay here, your wife doesn't want you here. And so his best friend, ironically, the one who was dating the same girl, comes to pick him up. And even that, I was so confused because I was just like, do you not understand what's going on here? If it was me as him, I probably would have punched him up. But he came and picked him up or came and met him basically and went with him to go um, take his stuff to his mum's. And I was just so confused. But anyway, the following day, um, I'd planned to speak to his friend, his, his best friend in the morning. And I'd spoken to him and told him the whole story. Because remember, like I said, up until this point, there were very, very few people that knew the whole thing, like they knew the whole story. One of the people that knew the whole story was my ex-best friend that I spoke to you about. When we were close, she knew about all of these instances that this plus one was involved in. So she knew everything. There was also another close friend of mine who knew everything. So when I spoke to him in the morning, I told him the whole entire thing. And he was just flabbergasted, like, what? This doesn't make no sense. Like, wow, that's my ex, da 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 so we're going back and forth and I'm explaining the whole thing to him. He's like, you know what, I'm going to speak to him. I'm going to go with his brother and I'm going to speak to him on a level and find out what's going on. So anyway, later on, I think they went and met up with each other again. And he was like, you know, she's told me everything. Like, what are you saying? Did you sleep with her? What's been going on? And he denied it till he was blue in the face. His brother was speaking to him. His best friend was speaking to him. He denied it till he was blue in the face. Denied it to me. Denied it to, denied it to pastor. We're going back and forth. But anyway, there was a week period, like the following week, immediately after this happening, because remember I said it fell into the weekend. It was our church conference, um, which is like a week program that's based in another church that everybody goes to. And I wasn't able to fully go that week because obviously I had work. And bearing in mind that at this time, my husband, me and my husband were working like different shifts. So I was working four days during the week and he was working like Friday and the weekend. So we kind of like alternated. When I was at work, he'd have the kids. And when he was at work, I'd have the kids. Obviously the following week, I would have expected him to like look after the kids because I had to go to work. And I'd messaged him, called him. He literally did not respond to me at all. And so I literally didn't have anyone to look after the kids for me. And you know, like I said, because it was conference that week, my sister happened to be off school because she's a teacher and you know between her and another friend that was in the church at the time they were able to look after the kids for me while I was at work but he literally just dis like kind of disappeared like there was no real contact between me and him I'd messaged him about you know basically what's going on venting my feelings about the whole situation he literally did not reply so I was just like what the hell is going on here? I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what was happening. I was literally so confused. But I managed to go um, to work, like I said, because of my sister. And it, it became apparent to me that by the end of the week that, you know, this wasn't going to work. I didn't know what was going to happen going forward. And it was way too short notice to like put the kids in childcare or put the kids in nursery because they were still quite young. They hadn't like gone into nursery properly yet. And so it was like, I literally had to quit my job on the spot. I went into work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever. And then um, by the Friday, I just said to my manager, like, I'm so sorry, I literally have to leave. I can't work four weeks notice because I literally don't have anyone to look after the kids. And I just told her, like, this is what's happened. All of the, you know, all of the depression, all of the anxiety that I had at work was basically culminating to this. This is what's like basically blown up in my marriage. I'm not gonna be able to function, number one. And number two, if I don't have childcare, I can't be here. And so they waived my four weeks notice and I literally quit my job the same day. And you can only imagine, how broken hearted I was because like I said, I loved my job. Not only have you violated me in ways that I could never imagine, but now because of your selfishness and because of your lack of accountability, I don't have a job anymore. So anyway, I left the job and it was like, like literally like just crashing down to earth. I literally went into like a sort of like, I don't even know what to call it. From the time that I found those messages in his phone, I literally couldn't sleep at night like I literally couldn't sleep I don't think I slept for like three months straight or and if I did fall asleep I would wake up like literally in the middle of the night sweating like as if someone was attacking me I, I couldn't eat properly I was losing weight and I also had this like this deep almost felt like a, a wound like a bruise in my stomach like you know when someone punches you in your gut and you feel winded that's how I felt at the time I was reading the messages but it literally felt like a bruise that I had for weeks like to the point where I could physically touch it and I would feel pain. So when we're talking about like trauma and we're talking about like um, sexual infidelity and infidelity, people brush it off like, oh, you know, it's just, it's just this. You know, whenever I've spoken to like a um, few people and even him himself, he would say things like, 
you know, I haven't really done anything. I never put my hand on you. But people don't understand how difficult it is to deal with the level of betrayal that comes with infidelity. It's, it's beyond like what words can ever describe. And like I said, when you're married to somebody and you're in a committed relationship, this is supposed to be your person. This is supposed to be your confidant. This is supposed to be the person that would ride for you and, you know, be willing to do anything to make sure that you're happy, that you're content, that you're at peace. They're willing to go to war for you. So to imagine that same person, you know, um, collaborating with other people to almost destroy you is, is beyond fathomable. I cannot even explain it, but I'm going to try and describe it to you from this book. So it says, there's even a name for it. It's called Intimate Deception Betrayal Trauma. The word betrayal comes from the Middle English root betraying, which means misled or deceive. According to Dr. Frank Seekins, the term betrayal dates back to ancient Hebrew, in which much like ancient Chinese, Egyptian and Arabic languages, every word is formed by adding pictures and sounds together to paint or illustrate the meaning of a word. Two ideas are conveyed, to betray or what comes from a person of chaos, and to deceive is to hide, cover, offend, deal unfaithfully or pillage. Betrayal is a deliberate act of disloyalty intended to dupe or cheat by lying and breaking someone's trust. What truly, what happened to you is truly traumatic. In fact, research points to the impact of betrayal trauma as post-traumatic stress. Because you go through the shock, it's the far-reaching impact, the mind-numbing disbelief about what's happened, the words that you've read, the pictures that you uncover, the conversations that you've overheard, or the unforgettable situation that you unknowingly walk into. And that's literally how I felt. Like, I can't, I cannot describe it any more than it was the most traumatic thing and you have to keep in mind that because this incident had happened in like micro forms prior to this big blow up with the camera you know with the talking behind my back on snapchat i'd already experienced some of this already and it was already festering which is where the first you know flare up with my skin even came about i was dealing with all of this internally there was even a point where you know after i had my daughter i was literally bleeding from my anal passage, like I was, every time I'd go to the toilet, I would bleed. And, you know, I was so terrified. I, I went to the doctors, they checked me, they said I didn't have piles, which usually you can get, you know, after you've had a labor. They were like, you don't have piles, you don't have this. And I, I really couldn't figure out why I was bleeding every time I went to the toilet. So it got to the point where they, they the hospital rushed me through to, as in like an emergency patient to find out. And they were doing all of these tests to find out whether I had bowel cancer. That's how deep it was. And the, every single one of their tests came back negative. I didn't have anything. But obviously over time, as I've done my own research and been able to get deep into like, you know, African systems and African healing and traditions, all of those symptoms that I was experiencing was just trauma coming out of my body because you don't bleed unless you had a traumatic wound inside of your body. But people don't seem to realize that an emotional wound is exactly the same, has exactly the same impact as a physical one. I'm gonna read this other part of the book as well. So it says, betrayed partners are devastated by shocking discoveries of all types of sexual infidelities, including pornography, prostitutes, cyber sex, same sex attractions and affairs, which leave them shattered, numb and in disbelief. The trauma of betrayal can cause the same type of post-traumatic stress that happens with military people who have been in frontline conflicts. Shock, anxiety, panic, anger, sleeplessness and depression become unwelcome bedfellows. And that's literally what I was experiencing. The e like to the point where because I had read like locations of where they had been, you know, having sex in open places, like to Bet Common, the um, ones of prison, you know, the park next to our house, I literally couldn't even I couldn't even take the kids to the park anymore. I couldn't even walk down that way anymore because I'd literally walk down there and I'll start having a panic attack because in my mind, I would have images about the things that they were doing. I would have images about them being in the park. I'd have images about them being, you know, in the car and all of these other things. I could literally see it in my head, mainly because I knew this girl. It's like, I feel that, I'm not saying that it would have been any easier to digest because betrayal trauma is betrayal trauma. But the fact that I was able to put a face to this person that my husband was, in this adulterous relationship with just made it even more sickening to me because I could see it. So it says, like soldiers returning from duty, betrayed partners seem okay on the outside for a while, but the unseen wounds of trauma continue to grow, fester, and poison them from the inside out. If left untreated, they can destroy a person's life. 
While no one would even question the impact of trauma on soldiers returning from their time of loyal service, many people still don't understand what trauma is. Some people have experienced trauma but may not even realise it. Women impacted by sexual deception and betrayal are among them. Instead of being blamed or shamed, women often feel relieved when they discover how they've been impacted by genuine trauma. Sexual deception is not simply a violation of trust that betrayed wives need to get over. When a woman is reacting to sexual betrayal, it's because she's looking for two necessary things, safety and truth. Safety and truth. And these are the two things that I, you know, when we, when we first started talking, is what I asked him for. I was like, listen, you have put me through the worst things imaginable and I have not made it open. I have not like expressed all of these things outwardly or made it known to people what I was going through. I didn't tell anyone anything. Like I said, other than the, the, like, the closest people to me, like my bestest friends, nobody knew what was going on inside of our marriage. And it's not to say that I was just keeping up appearances. I was genuinely fighting for my marriage in the sense that you know what, if, you, if you're truly repentant, if you're truly remorseful about the things that you've done, I'm willing to push forward with you as long as you're willing to make it right. And so the fact that I was able to do that and he would continually betray me in the same way was too much for my mind to take. And so I said to him, look, I've seen the messages, I know exactly what it is. All I'm asking you for is to tell me the truth. If, you're, if you tell me the truth and you tell me everything, I mean, lay everything down on the table, I don't care how gruesome it is, how disgusting it is, you tell me the truth, I won't divorce you, but I'm willing to go to counselling, I'm willing to do therapy, I'm willing to do everything it takes to, you know, to, to stay in this marriage. And he said, yeah, okay, cool, I'll tell you the truth. So I went back to these questions in my phone and I asked him the same questions and he gave me the same answers. And I was like, so you're, you're really telling me you didn't, you didn't have sex with this girl? No, I didn't have sex with her. Yeah, we kissed, yeah, we touched, but we didn't have sex. Fast forward, this had been going on for a long time. You know, obviously because my pastor knew about it, you know, um, at this point, he put him out of the church for, I think, three months. And he also put the plus one out of the church for three months. And he had told both of them that they would have to go to separate churches. So my husband was sent to a different branch of, you know, our, our fellowship. And she was sent to a different branch of our fellowship. This plus one, she went one to when she went to one service. She apparently she answered an altar call, which is like what Christians do when they're, you know, accepting Christ into their life. And she never went back to that church again. But every single day or every single week without fail, she would call my pastor on the phone. And she would be begging him to come back to our church, as in our home church, because she was adamant that she didn't do anything that warranted her being kicked out of the church. At this point, I was like, I'm dealing with a psychotic human being. She was calling my pastor every week, begging him to come back to the church because she didn't believe that she had done anything that warranted her being kicked out of the church. So anyway, my pastor was like, no, like the levels that this has gone to is beyond, like you're gonna have to just sit it out and wait. She didn't go back to that other church. At one point, she even started calling, you know, the assistant pastor of our church, who happens to be ex-partner before I got married to my husband, which made it even worse because, because of the dynamics of the situation, my pastor was like, I'm not gonna tell, you know, the assistant pastor, you know, what's happened because obviously, there's a dynamic here. I don't want him to really know what's gone in your marriage because of the connection. That's my, that's my first son's father. So he was just like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get him involved in this. So the fact that she was now calling him was even more crazy to me. Instead of you trying to like just lay low and keep quiet, now you're kind of you're making noise sort of thing. It was like even though I was trying my best to you know um, just function, you have to think to yourself that again. While I'm going through this process, I'm still looking after my kids. I had to look after my children. And so I'm, I'm dealing with this trauma. I'm dealing with, you know, um, all of this anxiety. I'm dealing with this pain. And I'm having to function normally. And it was, it was extremely hard. But on top of that, I'm being told every week, like, you know, this girl, she wants to come back. She's calling. She's doing this. She's doing that. And in my head, I was like, can this woman not just leave me alone? Like, I just wanted her to leave me alone. We've had all these conversations and it got to the point where I, I literally said to him, look, I'm not dealing with this anymore. Until, if you're not gonna tell me the truth, I'm gonna file for my divorce. And I truly feel like he thought that I was joking. I wasn't working at this point. And so I was able to, you know, file for my divorce, legal aid. I was able to apply for legal aid at this point. And so when I put in my application for the legal aid in regards to the divorce, they, they basically paid for it. And I think maybe in his mind, he thought, Raj doesn't have the money because it was expensive. I think it was like over 700 pounds. Um, but yeah, I filed for the divorce. And it wasn't until, 
you know, it came through the post at his mum's address that he realised that I wasn't playing around. And, you know, it didn't happen straight away. It took about six months from the time of, like, from the time of, like, finding out all of these, like, finding all of these messages in his phone to him actually confessing that he'd actually slept with this girl and been in a relationship with this girl. It was about six months. So you can imagine that like, for six months, I was literally like in turmoil, knowing the truth of what happened and having him like constantly drip feed me information, drip feed me new information. Like he didn't just tell me everything all at once. It was like every once in a while, I'd ask him a question and he would drip, 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 drip feed. And it was even more tormenting to me. So by the time he confessed this thing, it was literally because it had got to the second stage of the divorce process and he just didn't want me to divorce him. He was like, no, okay, cool. I'm gonna tell you the truth. But the funny thing is in that same week before he confessed, the girl was still calling our pastor, begging to come back to church. And at this point, this is when the kind of gaslighting and the spiritual gaslighting kind of started. Because they had lied about it for six months, straight. At this point, my husband was back in our church, but she wasn't. And she was like, oh, it's been three months. Why am I not back? Why is he back and I'm not back? Sort of thing. Because he was trying to like work it with me. But I was like, I'm not entertaining you. I'm not talking to you. I don't want anything to do with you until you tell me the truth. So we were coming to the same church, but we weren't like coming together, leaving together sort of thing. You could just tell that. You know, we were not in a relationship at that point. It, it started to basically become a case where, because they had lied about it for so long, people would start to disbelieve what I was saying. People were starting to disbelieve that anything had happened. They were saying that basically I was reading too much into it, that maybe what they're saying is true, that it basically I should just let it go. And this wasn't just coming from, you know, leadership in the church. This was coming from his best friend as well. Like, they, like people just started to disbelieve the whole thing. It was just like, you know what, this has been going on for long. They're not, like, they're both saying that nothing happened. Like, just let it go. If you want to stay married to him, like, just move on sort of thing. It's fine. And obviously she wants to come back to church. So you need to figure out, like, are you ready for her to come back? And in my head, I was just like, hold on, wait, wait, wait. Even though this situation has been happening since 2016, we're now in 2020. All whole years, I've been dealing with this plus one female that has been, you know, almost like been in the back seat of my marriage this whole time. She's been playing in my face the whole time, sending me messages on my birthday, making out like, oh no, me and you are cool, or at least I have some sort of respect or decency for you. But these times you're shagging my husband in the park. I just couldn't believe what I was hearing, just trying to process the fact that no, you know what, because, you know, this is kind of blown over now, I'm gonna let her come back to church. I just want to make sure that you're okay with it. And, you know, what Candice was saying in the beginning about, you know, me starting to feel like, you know, maybe I do need to be the bigger person. You know, maybe, you know, I do have to prove my Christianity. I do have to pr prove my woman of God status. I started to relent and I was like, you know what, she can come back, but she's only gonna come back after she's spoken to me face to face. I was like, she's not coming, she's not stepping a foot in this church until she has a conversation with me face to face. I'm gonna ask her the same questions that I asked my husband and I wanna see if she gives me the same answers. So. Our pastor was like, you know what? I don't really want to get involved in this situation right now because I feel like if I if I do a mediation between you two, she's going to think that she has to come back straight after that meeting. And I, do, I, I still want to give you that leeway or that time. So you go and meet her on your own with my wife. And, you know, once you've sat down with her, there's no obligation for me to bring her back because I wasn't involved. And for that reason, I want you to call her. I'm not going to call her, but I want you to call her. So I was like, all right, cool. Let's do this. I called her. The phone's ringing, the phone's ringing. Then she picks up, hello. And I was like, hi, um, I just wanted to find out if you were free on Saturday. Why are you calling my phone? That was the first thing she said to me. So in, like, you know when your blood is boiling, yeah? Where you're just like, I have not done nothing to this girl. <sighs> anyway, she was like, why are you calling my phone? And I was like, because pastor told me to call you and ask you if you were free on Saturday. She was like, well, why are you calling me instead of him calling me? And I was like, because he told me to. If you want to know why, you need to call him and find out. But he told me to call you, so that's why I'm calling you. Are you free on Saturday? She was like, yeah. I was like, all right, cool. Can you meet me here or here at such and such a time? And she was like, yeah, okay, cool. I'll meet you. And I was like, all right, fine. Thanks. I'll see you later. Locked off the phone. That was a Tuesday. Wednesday, we go to church. Pastor preaches a message. And my ex-husband answers the altar call. Like I said, this is what Christians do. And they're repenting or, you know, they won't accept Christ into their lives. After this service, I see him having a deep conversation with pastor. But I've already gone. I think I got in a car and left. But about 20 minutes, like, just as I was getting towards, like, you know, like, halfway towards Putney. My pastor calls me back. He's like, come, like, you need to come back to church now I need to speak to you basically I was like yeah you could tell me on the phone he was like no 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 I need you to come back I don't want you to be driving da, 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 da. before he even told me what he was going to tell me I already knew 
So I drove back to Kappa Junction and I got out of the car and the first thing he was basically saying was sorry. He was like, I'm, I'm like, I'm just so sorry. I spoke to your husband and he's basically confessed everything. He said, yeah, he did sleep with her. And I was like, all right, cool. At that point, it's like I was in shock, but I wasn't in shock. I was in shock, but I was more relieved that finally he was telling the truth. I couldn't be gaslit anymore. Up until that point, that like, people were literally treating me as if I was crazy. Um, you know, prior to this coming out, there was a real big push for her to come back into the church. And then it got to the point where, you know, as time was going on, as much as I was kind of like acquiescing a little bit, there was one day that I got up and I was like, no, I'm not putting up with this anymore. I'm actually not doing it. So I went back to pastor, our pastor, and I was just like, no, I've changed my mind. I'm not doing this anymore. Like I'm actually, I'm, I'm putting my foot down. This woman is not coming here and she's not gonna worship or, you know, serve God, quote unquote, in the same place that I'm trying to raise my kids in. This is actually perverted at this point. Like I know, regardless of what you guys wanna believe, I know that this woman has slept with my husband. So now you want me to allow her to come back into our family church, bearing in mind I brought her here where my children are and I'm supposed to just be walking past her in the corridors like I've been doing the last four years, pretending that nothing happened while my kids are here. I was like, no way. I was like, pastor, I love you, I respect you. But if you want this woman back in this church, I'm leaving, I'm taking my kids with me. I'm not coming here anymore. And I think at that point, that's when he started to kind of like double take. And he was like, you know what? I'm gonna to speak to some of the elders, some of the leaders in the um, in the fellowship and I'm gonna come back to you. So he went away, spoke to, you know, the head pastor of the fellowship of the, you know, the UK fellowship. He spoke to other leaders. And then he came back to me and he was like, oh, we've, you know, we've spoken about it. And we decided that, you know, would it be okay if she writes you a letter of apology before she comes back? No. I was like, no, what's a letter of apology going to do? I was like, pastor, if I said what I said, if she's coming back here, that's fine. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to dictate to you what you do with your church. At the end of the day, this is, this is your church. If she comes back, I'm leaving. I don't want her to write me nothing. I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to communicate with her. I don't want nothing to do with her. And I was so perplexed as to how, you know, people that were in positions of, you know, leadership within a church who's supposed to be standing for righteousness, who's supposed to be, you know, upholding integrity and, you know, justice, were able to come and tell me, the victim, the part, the one who's been betrayed, that somehow I need to forgive the woman who's violated me when she hasn't shown one ounce of remorse. She never apologized to me. And when I called her, she gave me the, the most rankest attitude. And I'm supposed to just like lay down because this is what Christ did on the cross. And like I said, the reason why I'm doing this video in the first place is because I want you guys to understand how degenerate this religious system is. Although they would uphold this level of, you know, piety and righteousness, it's a facade. They do not believe the things that they preach because the amount of dirt that they would cover up just for the sake of appearing a certain way is incomprehensible. And what they were asking to me to do, I realized at that point was incomprehensible because I was suffering for it, not just emotionally and mentally, but now I was suffering for it in my body, in my physical body. I just said no, and that was the end of that. And then I think he was kind of like, okay, cool, I'm just gonna leave it for a while. I'm not gonna say anything to her, we'll just leave it and we'll see what happens. But I had actually was like, I'm gonna call the head of the fellowship myself and speak to him myself because none of this was making sense to me. It took a while for me to get hold of him, but I spoke to him and told him the whole story from the beginning. Like, this is how I met this girl. She came to my wedding as a plus one. She came into the church because I brought her and these are the incidents that happened and these are all of the things that took place before we got to this point. And he was like, wow, your pastor didn't tell me all of this. So in my head, I was thinking, what exactly did he tell you? Because again, it's like giving the impression that I'm making up all of these stories in my head. Like, it's just, it's not even rocket science. Even if you were not even in a religious paradigm, there's nowhere in the normal world or what they would call worldly where anybody would put up with this level of gaslighting and neglect. So anyway, my husband's confessed now. And then I think pastors called this plus one girl and basically said to her like, rah, um, this guy's confessed like, what the heck? You've been lying to us for basically six months. Why didn't you just tell the truth? And at this point, I'm just gonna make it clear. I've cut out, even though I've been talking for a long time, I've cut out a lot of the story. So she apparently, I wasn't on the conversation. But based on what he relayed to me, she showed absolutely no remorse whatsoever. She was just like, I lied because he told me to lie. I, I lied because he told me to, he told me not to say anything. And so he was just like, but you've literally destroyed this woman's marriage. Someone who took you in to her home as her friend, someone who saw you as a sister, you've literally betrayed her, not once, not twice, but three times. And you don't have nothing to say for yourself. She said, no, I don't have anything to say. And even when, at, like after he got off the call, I remember him calling me and just saying to me, um, I think this woman's 
mentally disturbed. I think she's mentally ill. I don't think she's she's well. And even to this day, I still hold to that. I don't think she's well. That's, you know, besides the point. So after, after my husband had confessed, I asked him again and I was like, what do you want? Like, I don't know why it took you this long to tell me the truth because I knew all of this anyway. And I'm even more angry that you, you went to this point. You, you made it get to this point where everybody was doubting me and making it look like I was the crazy one, knowing full well what you'd done and what you'd been doing. Anyway, at this point, I was like, are you ready to tell me the truth? He said, yes, I'm ready to tell you the truth. He basically said that they had been, they had been sleeping together from the summer. So this birthday party that I told you about where, you know, our marriage was already on the rocks and we weren't talking. He said that he'd made his mind up that he was going to sleep with her after his birthday. So he slept with her at that point. So by the time we'd got to marriage retreat, they'd already had sex. So when I was telling him, I feel like you've done something. And I was like, tell me now, like, this is the best time to tell me because we'd be able to fix it. He lied to my face. And this is one thing that really just started to grind me and really started to erode my sense of reality because it was like, I cannot believe anything that comes out of your mouth. You've literally lied to me about any, everything. And then it just started to make me think, like, did you tell me the truth about the whole Snapchat incident? Did you tell me the truth about the camera incident? Because as I sit here now, as I'm talking to you right now, I truly believe that they slept together for the first time in 2016 when they disappeared for seven hours to buy me a camera. Fast forward a little bit. Um, now that he's confessed, we're actively working towards fixing our marriage. We're having conversations with pastor. Bearing in mind, this is 2020. So now the, the COVID thing had like gone full blown. Everybody was locked down. So we weren't allowed to go to church. We weren't allowed to do anything. Everything was over FaceTime or Zoom or whatever. And so we're having all of these calls with our pastor. And you know, I was reading all these books and we were like, I downloaded all of this material for us to go through. And to be honest, I was just doing the most. Like as a woman who truly loved this man, and truly like wanted to see her marriage restored. I was doing the absolute most like, and he was doing diddly squat. He didn't go, he didn't buy a book. He didn't, you know, go and seek help. He didn't go to therapy, he didn't do nothing. I was doing literally everything. I was still doing therapy. And even when my therapy, you know, had finished being paid for for my work, I was paying for my own sessions to continue. I was buying books. I was doing workshops. I was doing all of these things, not just to understand you know, my level of trauma and what I'd been through, but I was also trying to understand, you know, from his perspective, you know, the, inf the, the spouse that's actually committed the infidelity now has to deal with that shame. And I was trying to be sensitive with him with regards to dealing with the shame of what he'd actually done. And even as I'm saying it now, it's just so crazy to me that, you know, I'd got to this point in my life where I was so docile so like I'd become such a doormat to like other people and their you know their abuse and their emotional you know, violations towards me that I would still be considering other people's feelings above my own so we're doing all of this and it was in this period of time that I got pregnant with my third child so I'd gotten pregnant now and obviously this wasn't planned obviously and you know when I found out I was pregnant I was literally like beside myself because I was like of all the periods of time that I could be having a child why would I be having a child now? Because even though we were trying to do all this work, it was very evident to me that he wasn't pulling his weight. He was doing the bare minimum. He wasn't really, you know, trying. And even my pastor was like, there's nothing for me to work with. He's not, he's not giving me anything. He's not really, he's not really putting his heart into this. And I just didn't understand again, why somebody would be pushing for me to stay married to them, but you don't actually want to put in the work. So I was like speaking to like some of the older sisters in the church. And I was just like, well, it is what it is. There's nothing I can do about it, but I'm still going to divorce him. And it was like, what do you mean you're going to divorce him you're pregnant now so you have to make it work and this is again another like docile response from what i would consider like christians and religious people it's like you then they're never willing to look at the reality of a situation but are always wanting to like gloss over things because of how it looks or how would it look if you divorce your husband while you're pregnant but i'll be i'll be considering what he's done i'll be considering how he's still behaving towards me and it was like i don't at this point i don't care I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. As much as I was, you know, in denial, as much as I ignored all the red flags before we got married, as long as I, you know, was willing to put up with, uh, put up and shut up with all the things that he was doing, all the, the females that he was talking to, you know, the whole time that we were married, I felt like it, it, it had got too far. I had not signed up for all of this to happen. And so I was like, this, this just needs to end because if I stay in this relationship, this man is gonna kill me. 
he's either going to kill me physically or he's going to kill me emotionally. Either way, I'm not going to make it out of this if this continues. I'm pregnant now, whatever, whatever. And I was just at this point debating, do I go through with the whole divorce um, or do I work on the marriage? What pushed me over the edge and just made me feel like complete the whole thing. The stages of my pregnancies, I'm always sick for at least six months. Like my, my pregnancy sickness is so bad. So at this point, I hadn't told anybody I was pregnant. I hadn't told my mum. And um, we had basically planned to meet up and talk or whatever. So I'd asked my mum if she could look after the little kids. Last me and him had, you know, planned to meet up and talk. So I took the kids to my mum's house and it was almost like as soon as I went into her house, I felt the needed to be sick. So I literally had to run out of her house and vomit outside without her noticing that I was actually gonna throw up because I knew that if my mum saw me vomit, she'd know straight away I was pregnant. My mum, mums are just like that, they just know. So I ran outside, vomited on the street and I was like, no, we need to go because I don't want her to see me. I was driving us home or driving us to my house and I vomited again. I had to pull over on the side of the road. I vomited at least two or three times. I was literally, I just couldn't, I was literally just vomiting to the point where he got in the car and drove us the rest of the way. So we got to the house and I was like, oh, he was like, do you want me to get you anything? And I was like, yeah, can you get me some food? Can you get me some chips or something? Because at this point I'd vomited so much. I was literally just vomiting bile. Like, you know, when... Like you've got no food in your stomach and it's literally just like liquid, like stomach fluid that's coming out. It hurt. It's so painful. So I was like, let me eat something. At least if I'm vomiting up food, it won't be as painful. So he went out to the shops, went to get fish and chips for me or whatever. And then um, I was eating the food and I was just talking to him or whatever. And he just kept looking at his phone, looking at his phone. I was like, what, what? why are you here but you're not you're not engaging with me like what's going on he's like oh i'm just waiting for my brother because you know he's asked me to go with him to go and see a car that he wants to buy and i was like but this is not the time like this isn't the time we're talking about you know trying to fix our relationship and i'm sick so i i, I, I want you to stay here and he was like all right cool let me speak to my brother and whatever whatever so i just assumed that he'd spoken to him and basically just said, oh, you know what, like, Joe's sick, I'm just going to stay with her, I'll go see the car with you another time, or just, I can't come. But he came back, sat down, the time that he said that he was going to leave, he didn't leave, so I just assumed that he was staying. But, like, half an hour later, he was like, oh, you know what, I've got to go, oh, and he left me. At that point, that's when I was like, no, I'm not, that's it, I'm not, I'm not doing it. So I sent the last form, because I think the divorce, it, it, it goes in three stages. I'd already sent off the first two stages, and they were waiting on me to send the third. So after that incident happened, I sent off the third stage of my divorce. I didn't tell him about it. So anyway, when the divorce actually came through and they sent an email to both of us to say, you know, your, your, your marriage is, um, you know, annulled or whatever they call it, you know, you're, you're officially divorced, they sent the, the form. He was just like, he was literally beside himself because he didn't, like I said, I didn't tell him I was doing it. He didn't know I was going to do it. So for the first two weeks, he was kind of like, all right, cool, I'm going to support you. And, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, act like nothing's happened but I think it hit him and then he just turned stopped talking to me you know whatever it just went sour and it just it just went dead like he literally just didn't speak at all and so I was essentially going through this pregnancy now by myself that following November I remember like being so like torn up and so heartbroken about the whole situation that I was like, I can't, I can't stay here for our anniversary. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be reminded of all of this drama. And so I asked some of my closest friends if she would go away with me for the weekend, basically, so I wouldn't have to be in London for our anniversary. So we planned this trip away with the kids and it was lovely. We went to, you know, um, the seaside. I can't remember where it was now. Just needed that time away. It was such a, a refreshing time, but at the same time, it was still so painful to know that I was now carrying a third child for my ex-husband in the worst set of circumstances. Like I said before, when I was carrying my second daughter, I was going through all of the same like feelings and the emotions and of, of like betrayal and trauma and almost praying for a miscarriage. And now I found myself in the same position again where I'm carrying a child and it's not, you know, happy, you know, circumstances. I'm, I'm literally praying for another miscarriage because I don't want to carry a child for a man that I'm no longer with. Do you get what I'm saying? And so it was difficult. Anyway, around this time, I don't know, I don't even know how I managed to get, um, become friends with her, but there's a, there's a girl called Hannah Ayabusi on Instagram. You know, we just started talking and became friends. At this point, I remember like, I was the lowest, the lowest of the low. Like depression had got to like new levels to the point where I was actually contemplating that like, suicide. It was so 
bad. I literally couldn't sleep. I still wasn't eating properly. Obviously, I was pregnant and I just felt just, I just, I just didn't know what to do with myself. And so I had contacted this lady um, who kind of like specialised in betrayal trauma. I found her, her details on Tony Gaskin's website. I paid for a therapy session, which was about £60. Um, but anyway, I called her and I was talking to her on the phone and like similar to this, the sort of therapy sessions that I had before, I couldn't even sit through like talking to her on the phone. I was literally just crying and crying and crying to the point where the woman was just like talking to me, like encouraging me, you know, telling me her story, how she was able to get through it and how, you know, it won't always feel like this. It won't always be like this. I literally couldn't even speak. Literally, after I'd come off the phone to this lady, Hannah had told me that she was going to put me in contact with you know, one of her mentors that she was really close to because she, we remind, I reminded her of her in terms of how, how I just was, how I saw homeschooling, how I saw like raising children and stuff. So she was like, I'm gonna link you to on Instagram and you two can kind of talk. At this point, I hadn't told Hannah anything about what was going on with me. I hadn't told Hannah I was pregnant. I hadn't told Hannah about what was going on in my marriage at all. As far as everyone on Instagram or on my social media was concerned, I was still, happily married to my husband and nobody was like any wiser. If anything, people might have suspected because I had deleted everything of him, of all of my social media channels, including my YouTube, including my Instagram, just literally everything. But other than that, nobody really knew what was going on. But literally, this was just as I'd got off the call to this woman and I was literally like, I can't even describe to you how I felt. Suicide is the only thing that comes to mind. I just wanted to just not live anymore. And at this point, I hadn't told anybody that. So. At this point, I hadn't actually vocalized that to anybody, that I was not okay. I felt like there was something about this woman's presence, even though it was through the phone, that I just felt like she was somebody that I could trust with everything that I was experiencing at that time. And so I sent her my number, she called me, like similar to the conversation I literally just had with the therapist over the phone. I literally couldn't, I could barely speak. I was crying. Like I just, I was just almost inconsolable and I feel, I'm not sure how long we've been divorced at this point. It might have been maybe a couple of months, maybe like three months or so. Um, but I just, I just couldn't, like, the weight of everything that was happening around me was just too much for me to carry by myself. And so she was talking to me and I was telling her the whole story from the beginning. And literally I was on the phone to her for hours and hours and hours. Um, but she was so reassuring, like she was so kind and she prayed for me and she was like, literally, she just became a solid rock for me during that period of time. And I always say like, if it wasn't for her, I literally do not know what would have happened in terms of me. Like I, I do, I, and that's honestly, that I like hand on my heart, I do not know what would have happened because there was nobody who was able to really like reach me in that, in that moment with what I was going through. And the therapist that I'd spoken to on the phone, like that session, that like hour session that I was on the phone to her had cost me 60 pounds. And she'd actually sent me an email even after the session to say that she didn't realize that her phone um, didn't cover UK calls. So she'd been given like a 200 pound phone bill for the, for the duration of the call or something. So she wouldn't be able to continue sessions with me. So it was literally like divine timing, literally divine timing. I was talking to this lady like pretty much every day that like she would always be checking on me, making sure that I was okay, da 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 da. And in this period of time, my ex-husband was being like the most difficult person to deal with. Like he wouldn't help me with childcare because at this point I was looking for, I was interviewing for another job. He wasn't sending me money. He said he didn't feel the need to send me any money for the children. Like it was just really, really messed up the way he was going on. And so I'd spoken to this lady about it and she was like, you know what, if you speak to your ex-husband and tell him like, and invite him to come and see me and my husband to just sit down so we can help you with like the whole co-parent, co-parenting aspect of things. You know, the fact that you're ba you're carrying a baby right now, I'm just really concerned for you and your baby's well-being because you're under too much stress. I feel it would be a good idea for us to sit down and talk. I was like, me and him haven't spoken like properly for months. We haven't been amicable for months. So it would just seem a bit out of the blue, but I'm gonna ask him anyway. So I sent him a message and I was like, look, I've been in contact with this lady. Her and her husband are, you know, counselors and they work with people that have got issues within their marriages and all of these different things. And they deal with like co parent and stuff. Would you be willing to go with me to go and see them because they lived all the way in Milton Keynes? And he was like, um, yeah, I'll, I'll go, which was shocking to me because I didn't think he would agree, but he was like, yeah, I'll come. And he was like, oh, how much are they charging? And I was like, no, they, they haven't charged, they haven't said that they're gonna charge us anything. They're just willing to help. He was like, yeah, he'll come. So I called her back and I was like, yeah, he's, he's, he's down for it. So we arranged a time and a place 
and then we, you know we said we would go so he came to meet me and um we sat down and you know we'll, it was kind of awkward at the beginning it was kind of like well nice to meet you because obviously we're all meeting for the first time even though you know i'd spoken to um this lady for a couple of months at this point or a couple of weeks at this point obviously my ex-husband had no idea who these people were it was just like basically strangers and so it was kind of awkward like oh hi nice to meet you sort of thing like we're you know we're da -da 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 -da. introducing ourselves and you know um they were kind of like okay cool what do you want us to do where are we at with this whole thing like how did we get here and so we're talking about the situation and you know um, the lady's husband was talking to my ex-husband and was just like what's the situation how do we get to this point and he was just like yeah cool this is what happened blah 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 so obviously we'd gone there with the with the mindset to you know just figure out the whole care co-parenting issue and make sure that we're kind of co-parenting effectively so whatever's going on between us isn't affecting the children and obviously we've got this new baby coming as well but he kind of took it like turned like twisted it a bit and he was just like you know what like just listening to what you said to me and what you've kind of talked about the fact that you're having a baby right now i just want to ask the question like and he was directing this at my ex-husband like if you had an opportunity to you know get back with your wife and kind of restore your marriage would you take it and his answer was yes which was shocking to me because the way that he was treating me up until this point i never for a second would have thought that he would come out with the answer because he was just like you can see how broken this woman is like this is not something that you can kind of play games with and be joking about you've really like brought her to this point you're gonna have to do a lot of work not just to heal her heart but you're gonna have to really protect her you're gonna have to do this you're gonna have to do that you know we're willing to help you and like coach you through this whole process but we do not want you to say you're gonna you're gonna do it and basically waste our time and so they asked me like obviously how do you feel about it blah 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 blah, blah. and in my mind even though like i'd been through this whole experience with him there was a part of me that still loved him and so when i heard him say that he wanted that he would want to work on a marriage the fact that i was carrying his child at that time i was like if we can fix it then i'm really willing to try and fix it not like oh let's get married tomorrow but let's just try and do you know some sort of restorative work if it works out then great if it doesn't work out then at least we've kind of sifted through some of the issues that kind of just got buried and we're able to be a bit more you know amicable towards each other if it doesn't work out and so i said okay cool we can do that so from that point onwards it was like we were just kind of working things out you know this was getting towards september and so you know they set us they would set us like tasks to do where they would be like you know this week we want you to go out and these are the questions that we want you to ask each other and these are the things that we want you to talk about you know we want you to be honest we want you to be open and all of these things and so that's what we did so the first meeting that we had you know after we had this session with the couple was literally like to talk about everything and ask him you know everything to do with you know this plus one female you know how did this start where did it start and all of the things that were coming out were just like even though i thought he had told me everything that he told me before like more things were just coming out but it was like at the same time it, it was things that i kind of inherently knew but it was still devastating to hear him confirm it so anyway we had a few meetups you know he he went all out to you know get me something for my birthday and you know at this point my mum was aware of what had happened especially because like i'd gone so deep into this depressive state like i said i needed that support so at this point she knew what happened and she was just like absolutely like not so the fact that i had invited him to the house while my family were there was kind of like getting off like trying to get my family kind of used to the idea of him kind of being around again even though we hadn't really gone full blown out and said okay we're back together or we're you know we're in a relationship so i invited him to the house you know he brought me these gifts for my birthday he was like oh yeah happy birthday da -da -da -da. just doing the most literally that same week it was a saturday and i had asked him basically to go and go to primark and get some wellies for the kids because they needed it for um needed it for school the whole day went and i remember him texting me in the evening around six and he was like oh i, I went primark and i couldn't find no wellies so i'll go somewhere else and get them and i said okay literally within half an hour of him telling me that you know he couldn't find these wellington boots a close friend of mine like one of my closest friends called me and was like i don't know how to tell you this I don't know i don't know how like to, to tell you I, I don't even know how to say it and i was like you're scaring me like what is it she was like i, I can't like it's like are you are you sitting down and i was just like what is going on what are you trying to tell me she was like i don't know how to tell you this but i just want you to be calm i don't want you to panic i don't want you to get upset basically someone from the church called me like because they didn't want to call you directly because i didn't have that close relationship with them but they had called her to tell her that they had seen 
my ex-husband and the plus one on the street basically together on the street and the way she described it it was like they were very comfortable they basically looked like they were in a relationship she didn't go into details of what they were doing or what what was going on but she was just like it looked really off key and i'm just letting you know because i don't want to not say anything this is your closest friend so when she told me you know that sucker punch that i was telling you about earlier on in the video like feeling like the wind has been knocked out of your stomach I couldn't believe what I was hearing because obviously, again, once again in my mind, from the time that he had confessed what had happened and, you know, she had shown no remorse for the situation and my pastor had like officially told her to leave the church and not come back. In my mind, they had not had any sort of contact ever again. And now that we were kind of like working with this couple, to try and you know restore our relationship somehow. I couldn't fathom how he was still talking to her. So I texted him again and I was like, who are you with today? And his response was, why are you asking? And I was like, I'm gonna ask you one more time or you are not gonna like what happens next. Who are you with today? And then his response was, well, if you're asking me, then you must already know. I was like, I called, literally, I called the lady straight away and I told her what happened. And I think she was even more confused. Like, what are you talking about? Like, this is not, this is not like adding up. We didn't speak about this. We didn't even know that they were still in communication. Obviously nobody did. And so they were just like, we're gonna speak to him. We're gonna, we're gonna phone him. So her husband, obviously, because she was more talking to me and her husband was more talking to him, he called him and he wouldn't pick up his phone. I think for a good week, he didn't pick up his phone calls. So I basically said to them, like, I do not want anything to do with this man anymore. I don't want him to talk to me. I don't want anything to do with him. Like at this point, I just felt physically sick. And I will never forget the week, like the few weeks that like followed this discovery of the fact that they were still seeing each other and still with each other. I couldn't function. It was almost like I was on autopilot, but I could have easily just driven my car off a cliff because I was so numb to what I was feeling and what I was experiencing. I really didn't know how to process what was what, what was happening. I literally was like, if, if that period of time when I came into contact with this lady was bad, this was worse. So I was just like, I don't even know what to do. So anyway, they had a pack, like eventually they got hold of him or the, the, the husband got hold of him and he basically said to him like, bro, don't call her. Don't call her, don't text her, don't try and see her. And he was like, oh, but what about my kids? I need to see my kids. Like, I need to have contact with my kids. And I was like, I don't, I don't want any communication with him whatsoever. I don't want him to call me. I just, I just wanted him out of my life at the point. Um, I just needed time just to figure out what I was doing, how I was moving forward. Um, and they basically just said to him, look, just give her that four weeks, just give her four weeks. Don't call her, don't communicate with her, don't try and speak to her. Even in that month that they told him not to talk to me, he actually texted me. Again, boundaries. Doesn't have a clue what they are. Um, I ignored him and I just called the lady straight away and I just said, he's texted me, tell him not to text me again. I refuse to speak to him. So anyway, after the four weeks had kind of passed and we agreed that we were gonna have this meeting over Zoom, because as we said, this was like during COVID time. And plus they lived all the way in Milton Keynes. We were like, we're gonna have this meeting over Zoom. They had basically told him like that, you know, this was getting to the point where it was becoming depraved now. This is like depravity, like the bottom of the barrel. Like you violate this woman so much. You're carrying your child. You've come all the way to Milton Keynes and told us that you wanted to work on this marriage only to be still doing all of this stuff behind her back. When we jump on this Zoom call, you are gonna tell her the truth about absolutely everything. And we're not just talking about this female, we're talking about everything that you've, you've ever kept from her that you haven't told her during your marriage. You're gonna tell her everything. Because he'd already told the husband, apparently. He told him everything and he was like, you're gonna to have to tell her because there's no way we're gonna support anybody trying to restore any marriage if you can't be truthful, it's everything that you want to build upon is gonna start with truth. So we jumped on this Zoom call now, and at this point, I'd already prepared my mind for what he was gonna say, and I'd already prepared my mind to be accepting of whatever he said, and not shame him, if that makes sense, because once again, I was more considering how he felt rather than how I felt. I was doing the bigger person thing, I was doing the Christ, 
like woman of God thing where it was like, okay, cool. I'm the one who's clearly, you know, still in Christ, still serving God, still in my right mind. He's clearly a hot mess, doesn't even know what he's doing with himself. So let me show him that grace and extend that grace. Now, one thing I've learned about grace is that it's not a free pass to do whatever you want and treat people however you want to treat them. Grace is earned, it's not just given. But that's another story for another day. So we've jumped on a Zoom call now. He's like, just talking to me about stuff that he's never spoken to me about before. That in addition to him obviously having a sexual relationship with the plus one, he also had another sexual relationship with the friend of a family member. And this happened all the way back in 2016. So he basically said there was a situation where, you know, when he was still playing football, he had an opportunity to speak to this girl. And like I said, he was constantly speaking to other women behind my back. And you know, a lot of the time where I would find out or I would find messages in his phone or I would see women talking to him, they would always kind of reject him and kind of tell him like, Ra, I'm not getting involved with you because I know that you're married with children, like, allow it. But this particular female obviously slipped through the net because I had no idea about this one but she basically accepted his advances. He ended up going to her house and, you know, she performed sexual acts on him, but he says that he didn't, you know, have full blown sex because he felt guilty about what he did. He came home and just pretended it never happened. Then he went on to tell me that, you know, from the time that, you know, the divorce went through, he basically went back to the plus one and that they had been, you know, in a prolonged sexual relationship after our divorce went through, which I kind of expected anyway, but at the same time, it was like, from the time that you said, I wanna work on my marriage, that should have been cut off. So he's confessed all of these different things, confessed everything, and then we've gone back to this, okay, what are we doing now? Are we moving forward? Or are we, you know, are we, are we pulling back? And I think at this point, I'm getting ready to have my baby now. My daughter was born in January. And so even though we weren't like, there was a point where I was kind of like cut off from the whole thing. I was still sort of like trying to be amicable for the sake of the baby that I was having. So after my daughter was born, because he obviously he was around coming down, you know, frequently to see the baby and stuff. We were kind of like, I wouldn't say back together. We were kind of back together in a sense that we were, we were literally working towards you know, restoring the marriage, like, properly at this point, especially since he confessed everything. It was like, okay, we're building this, you know, new marriage on this foundation of truth. So, you know, fast forward, this was the time when, you know, I got evicted from, you know, our property in Putney. You know, the, the council messed up our housing again, and then we ended up in um, a hotel all the way in Heathrow for, like, a good five months. Now, during this period, there were so many red flags that again were coming up. One of them being that, you know, on his birthday, he had told me that he was gonna go out with his brother. And, you know, this was weird to me because he's never really had that relationship with his brother where he's ever said, oh, me and my brother are going out. I just thought it was really strange. But him and his brother were gonna go to um, this restaurant in China, um, Chinatown and he was gonna celebrate his birthday with his brother and then we'll do something another time or whatever because this was the time that I was like deep into the Adventism that I was telling you guys about in my first video. So I'd left the church at this point, my old church at this point, because of all of the madness that they were gaslighting me with and you know, trying to like just, it was just too much and ended up in seven day Adventism. And so on Saturdays, I was like, I'm not doing anything. This is the Sabbath, I'm not doing anything. And because his birthday fell on a Saturday, he was like, all right, cool. I'm gonna go out with my brother and then we'll do something another day. So fast forward um, a little bit, my, my first son's birthday fell on a Sunday and there was a whole mix up with that because he had a birthday party, blah, 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 blah. And so I had picked him up and spent his birthday with him, but I didn't go to his party because you know, they planned a party for him on a Saturday with again, I wasn't gonna go. I mean, again, this kind of just goes back to the whole, when you, when you subscribe to an ideology or a belief system, it literally controls your life. The fact that I didn't go to my son's birthday party because I was strongly in the belief that I would be sinning if I, if I did go is mental to me, but here we are. I picked him up and brought him to the hotel one day just to, you know, spend time with him. And I remember him being really upset, like just vocalizing to me, like, mom, like, rah, I was really, really upset that you didn't come to my party. But I was like, babe, like I came all the way down to your house, like two hour drive to pick you up and come back on your actual birthday, spent the whole day with you. We had pizza, you know, ice cream, whatever, whatever. I spent your birthday with you, but he was like, no, but I wanted you to be there for my birthday. And so I was like, 
I don't want you to feel like I'm just isolating you. I didn't spend my husband's birthday with him either, essentially, my ex-husband's birthday with him either. So if you want to, you can ask him. But there was a part of me that was kind of like just seeing if I could catch him out. So when I went back upstairs to the hotel, I was like, babe, like, sp tell him that I didn't spend your birthday with you. And he was like, nah, like your mum said it was a Sabbath, so she didn't do nothing with me that day. So I was like, who did you spend your birthday with? Just to see if he would give me the same answer. And he mentioned someone completely different. So I kept that in my mind. I was like, oh, okay, cool. All right, cool. So then when my son had left, I sat him down and I was like, do you realise that you told me at the time that you went out with your brother and now you're telling me that you went out with someone else? And he was like, oh, no, no, we went together. I did go with my brother, but obviously Thingy was there as well. At that, literally immediately, I knew he was lying to me. I called the lady and I was like, no, I can't do this. Like, I actually cannot do this. And it's so funny because at, at this time I'm, I'm talking to you about this, this was like 2021. This was like the summer of 2021. We spent the summer of 2021 in this hotel. This whole time period, we were going back and forth, you know, working on, quote unquote, working on a marriage, when really and truly he wasn't pulling his weight at all. He barely came to the hotel to see us, even though he'd made like all of these, you know, make all of this drama. Every time like I would ask him for like, you know, time away from him, he would make this big scene about wanting to see his kids. But when he had full access to them, he was barely around. Even when we were um, given our property, like where I live now, he literally worked five minutes away, like walking distance, less than 10 minutes away from here. And we would probably see him like once a week. He was barely around. And so it got to the point where it was like, I had to just start to listen to myself and really question like, what am I doing? I've been, you know, dealing with this man on and off essentially for like six years at this point, And he's never shown me anything else but lies and infidelity. Why am I wasting my time? So anyway, this is when it started to get really like messy because we, we kind of separated again for a bit and then we decided to get back together again. This time it was around my daughter's birthday. This was May 2022. This is May 2022. And the reason why I'm, I'm being specific about dates because I know that there are people that know both of us that might watch this video and be like, yeah, but this time he was doing this. I know. So May 2022. Um, we were like, oh, let's go away as a family. You know, we're really trying to like focus on building our marriage. You really want to set the foundations. You know, let's start a clean slate. Let's go away for the week, like for a week with the kids da -da -da -da, to celebrate my daughter's birthday. So we went away to Wells um, with, you know, our closest friends, spent the, 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 a couple of days in Wells. And I noticed just his demeanor and the way he was carrying himself on that trip just really wasn't adding up to me. In addition to that, he was posting like, things on his you know Instagram that was indicating or giving the impression that he was on this trip by himself and I didn't get that in my head I was thinking you know as a man who's done all the things that they've done and is actively you know working towards getting their wife back you know wanting to be a family man and get his children back I just found it very strange that he was doing the most to try and portray that he was living a single life Anyway, again, I'm doing what I, I usually do. I'm doing what I've always done. I'm ignoring all of the red flags because, you know, in my mind, I just couldn't fathom that somebody would be so insistent or so adamant that they want to be with me and not actually want to be with me. So it was like I was compensating for all of the, the things I was seeing, all of the red flags I was seeing and making excuses for it in my own head. Anyway, I started to get like the same intuitive like messages that I'd got before with regards to something's not right, something is off, something is really like off key. And I was seeing these synchronicities everywhere. And then I started to have dreams. And from my experience, like I said before, it was a dream that exposed, you know, their previous relationship. And it was dreams that had always told me or just intuition or my intuitive feelings that told me before whenever something was, was going on. And this was starting again and it would always be like, a meet like almost immediately it would just come out of nowhere and I would never be able to shake it off so I started to get these synchronicities I started to get these intuitive feelings and then I started to have dreams and it got to the point where I had three dreams in a row like night after night Monday Tuesday Wednesday I had three dreams in a row and every single one of these dreams featured this plus one and I was like I have not dreamt about anything to do with this girl hadn't spoken to her haven't seen her haven't known anything about any situation from that time that, you know, that person said they saw them in the street. And so I was like, I, again, I did what I did before and I just asked him. I was like, you know how I am with my dreams, right? He was like, yeah. I was like, I've had a dream three nights in a row about this girl. Are you talking to her? No, I'm not talking to her. Are you sure? No, I'm not talking to her. I haven't spoken to her since da 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 da. I was like, don't lie to me. 
because every time I've had these feelings, every time I've had dreams like this, they've always shown to be exactly what they're telling me. No, I haven't had nothing to do with her, blah, 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 blah. I was like, all right, cool. Literally, within that same week, we were downstairs in my kitchen. I was sitting on his lap because he was showing me something on his phone. And all I just see, her name pop up on the screen. I looked at him and it was an Instagram message. It wasn't an, an iMessage or a WhatsApp, it was an Instagram message. And he was talking to her on Instagram. I turned around and I looked at him and I was just like, I just shook my head and walked off. You know when you just feel like history just keeps repeating itself again and again. But at this point, I literally felt like Boo Boo the Fool in a sense that I couldn't even be angry. I didn't react. You know like how I reacted before where I was shouting and going crazy and like telling him to get out of my house, whatever. I had absolutely no emotion. I didn't move, I didn't speak, I didn't say anything. I, ca I calmly got off his lap, came upstairs to my room and just sat down at the window, just pondering everything that was going on in my mind. And I just thought to myself, do you know what? I can't even blame anyone but myself. I can't blame anyone but myself. At this point, my daughter was probably about six months old. So you can imagine, this is like, from the time that I've discovered all of this madness in 2019, this is like two years on, and we're still, we're still going over the same thing, the same female. So I was sitting at the window and he was just going crazy. He was beside himself, like, please talk to me. Like, talk to me. Like, like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What's gonna happen with us? And I was just like, please just stop talking. I can't, just don't talk. I don't have nothing to say. I just sat there in silence for ages. And then he started crying. He started like, not throwing himself on the floor, but just like, you know, putting himself on the floor, grabbing his hair, grabbing his hands. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's wrong with me. And, you know, looking back on all of this now and knowing all the things that I know now, like that is like the typical narcissistic response to, you know, you are the abuser. You are the, you are the one that is, you know, in the wrong. You're the one that's perpetuating, you know, the same betrayal and the same violations. But then when you get exposed, you almost turn into the victim because he was crying. He was acting up. He was doing all of this stuff. And I was just looking at him just in awe, like, is this really my life? Is this really what I'm gonna sign myself up to? I divorced this man in 2020. So officially, as, I'm, as we're going through this process, we've been divorced, but I've shown you, you know, a sort of like grace. I've extended this grace that you didn't even deserve in order to get back with you. And even at this time, we were even talking about him coming back home and actually moving back into the house. And I was just looking at him and I was just like, I feel like he kind of knew, like the fact that I wasn't even reacting at all. There were not even a teardrop from my eye. It was almost like everything in me was just like, no, this is it. I can't, I'm not doing it. So he basically goes home. And I remember speaking to the lady on the phone. At this point, like I said, we've been talking to her for like over a year at this point. And she was just like, no. She was like, after all this time, after all the, you know, the, the sessions that we've had with you, Zoom calls, and they would spend hours, the same way that my pastor used to do, like years before, they would spend hours talking to us on Zoom calls. We'd been to their house multiple times, going through all of these sessions and every single task that they had asked him to do, you know, for himself in order to like build him up and kind of encourage him to be a man and to really like, you know, display himself as trustworthy. He had done absolutely nothing. So I basically just said to Liz, I'm not, I think this is it. I'm not doing this anymore. She agreed with me. She was like, I've never seen anything like this before in my life. All, all the couples that we've counseled, of all the people that we've seen and spoken to and we've dealt with infidelity issues and all of these different things, she was like, I've never met anybody on this man's level. I said, okay, cool. And I just had to bide my time thinking about how I was gonna just be like, you know what, I can't do this anymore. And I remember anniversary of our divorce came round. The only reason why I remember the exact date of our divorce is because it fell on my sister's birthday. So I remember my sister's birthday came up and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. You've been divorced for two years. You're dealing with exactly the same issues with exactly the same person and exactly the same perpetrator and in my mind I was thinking no I, I'm not and I think I just sent him a text I can't remember if I texted him or called him I think I called him and I just said to him you know what this is legit it like I'm, I'm not doing this anymore I don't have anything else to say but I'm just I'm just I'm just making it clear two years since we've been divorced you've done nothing you've proven nothing you've lied to me you've lied to my face X amount of times you betrayed me, X amount of times. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. So that's it, it's the end. Anyway, 
even though we, our relationship was done, like fully, fully done, we were still cool, if that makes sense. Like there was no real animosity. And I feel one thing I would say I'm grateful for is doing that, like that year's work with the couple that we were working with, it kind of allowed us to, it allowed me, should I say, to be amicable with him despite everything that happened. Do you get me? I'm not saying it was good because I don't think it was really in the long run, but at the time it was it was enough for me to just, you know, get by. It was enough for me to just function. But I knew that I needed to like kind of get away. Like prior to, you know, us separating, like for the final time, I had been discussing with him that I wanted to move abroad. I wanted to move to Ghana and we were talking about buying land and, you know, going and living abroad and all of this stuff. And we were talking about, you know, I would go first because he had work and, you know, I would go and buy the land and we would do this and do this and whatever. And we and he would kind of join us after. So when we separated fully, it was kind of like, okay, cool. We're not together anymore, but I'm still going. Like, I don't want to live here. I want to go, like, I want to live abroad. And so regardless of whether me and you're together, I'm still going. And so I started planning my trip. At first I was going to Ghana, but then I was, you know, there was, you know, this is, you know, there was still a lot of um, COVID restrictions going on. You couldn't really fly anywhere and all of these different things going on. But long story short, I ended up going to Tanzania. Those that you follow me on Instagram know, I ended up going to Tanzania. And then I didn't go to Ghana until later, but literally within a month of me hitting Tanzania, that's when my skin broke out. But literally, I literally relapsed like, I had never recovered with regards to the skin issues that I had before. And I didn't know what was going on with me. I was doing all these like, you know, extreme fasting and diets to the point where I lost so much weight. I was literally anorexic. Then my feet became really swollen and I was dealing with the whole weeping and all of this madness was happening to me. And I remember speaking to like a therapist and I was dealing with some like holistic practitioners, you know, abroad in Tanzania and also in Ghana. And I was like, what is happening to me? I don't know what's going on. And they were basically like to me, because of the level of you know trauma that you experienced when you were in the UK, when you left the country and you got here, it was almost like your body was aware that it was in a safe space to release everything. And now all the trauma that you've, you've held onto and have essentially buried over the years is coming out. And I knew at that point that, you know, not only did I have to just accept it, and just go through the process. There was an aspect of this that I had brought upon myself. There was a level of this that I had kind of allowed because I refused to put my foot down from the beginning. And as I've gone through and reiterated this whole story, like I said, I've cut out so much, you know, just for the sake of time. There was even a period of time when, you know, when it first initially came out and they were still kind of like in denial, my ex best friend, who I said that he was in close close relationship with, you know, including her mum and all of this this messy like network that he had. The plus one had basically told my friend who had called her, like bearing in mind, because I had brought her to church, initially I was her only friend in the church. Once she had made other friends, she was making friends with people that I was already friends with. And one of those people was one of my closest friends till this day, who I'd known from the age of 13 years old she had to become close to her at some point as well. So when I told her everything that happened, she was like, this is mad. I don't even know if I can believe this. So she called her, like without letting me know anything, she called her and we just like, no, seriously, what's going on and what did you do? I didn't do nothing, I swear down. Like I promise you, I swear, I swear on my life, I didn't do anything. This is what she's reiterating to me. She didn't do anything, she had done absolutely nothing and she was telling, you know, my friend on the phone, that she had spoken to my ex-best friend and told her that she was talking to my husband on this level, but she wanted to be accountable to someone. Um, and basically she hadn't said anything. So in my head, I was like, if she'd spoken to her like months before, cause she was talking about this, that like this was like a year ago. Are you meaning to tell me that this girl is also in the same church with all of us? She had an inkling that my husband was doing something with this female and she also didn't say anything. So when everything kind of kicked off and he was put out and she was put out, she knew exactly what had happened. And so I hadn't told anybody at that point what had happened and neither had he. But her mum, my ex-best friend's mum, knew and also said, oh, it was one of the twins, isn't it? These times no one had told her nothing. And this is when I started to realise how degenerate the church was because it wasn't just the leadership that were able to decipher or determine, you know, what would be the best thing to do in a situation. There was another time where I suggested speaking to the girl's dad. Cause like I said, because we were so close, I'd met her parents. Um, they'd come to our church to see her get baptized with her sister. And I remember her dad, you know, speaking to me and being like, oh, I'm so glad that you brought my daughter to church because he was also, 
you know, um, a born again Christian, and he was like, I'm so glad my daughters are in church. I'm so grateful for, for you to bring in them and just, you know, just showing her so much love and, you know, just taking care of her and whatever, whatever. I'd been to the dad's house. I was like, I'm just going to call her dad. Like, I'm either going to call her dad or I'm going to call her sister. And everybody was like, no, because if you speak to them, you're going to come across like you're bitter and all of these different advice I was getting. But if you really think about it, just the, the madness of what this woman was able to do in my life. And essentially she was able to just kind of walk off scot-free and get away with it to the point where we're still dealing with this issue to this day. So anyway, I'd been in Tanzania for a period of time and I, my, my health was deteriorating and deteriorating to the point where I couldn't function by myself anymore. And I had to get help, like house help to help me just do stuff in the house because I was so ill. My mum was like, come back to the UK because you're sick. Like, you're so sick. You, I, like, she was worried for me. But I knew that if I came here, there was a possibility that I would die of hypothermia. And that's not an, an exaggeration. Like, when your skin is that bad, your body cannot regulate its own temperature and you always feel cold. Bearing in mind that I was in, like, the hottest climate. I'm talking about, like, between 30 to 40 degrees heat. And I was always cold. I knew that if I came back to the UK at that time of year, I wouldn't make it. And so I was like, mom, let me go to Ghana. Like, obviously we've got family there. You know, I've got my sister there. Let me go to Ghana instead because at least I've got more support or whatever, whatever. So I ended up moving from Tanzania to Ghana. So when I got to Ghana, that's when I really kind of let my hair down, you know, focused on healing, focused on getting my skin to where it was supposed to be. And you know, throughout this whole entire process, my ex-husband was cool, we were talking all the time. I was pretty much speaking to him every single day. You know, there was no issues. He'd be talking to the kids on the phone. I was sending him pictures about what we were doing, what we were getting up to. And you know, while I was staying with my friend in Tanzania, again, I wasn't someone who would just tell people about what I'd been through with my husband, my ex-husband. Like, it, it would have to be, there would have to be a reason for me to even bring it up. But there was a situation that happened where I found myself crying because, again, like I said, I've been speaking to this therapist that was in Tanzania. And when she was talking to me about this whole trauma thing and the fact that, you know, my body was just releasing the trauma it had been holding, I was very emotional and I was crying about it. So she was like, well, what's going on? Like, what's happening? So I told her the story and she was just like, this is the same person that you're talking to all the time, right? The kid's dad. And I was like, yeah. And she was like, this, is, this isn't right. She was like, why are you even talking to him like that? Like, why does he feel comfortable enough to talk to you on that level? The way that he's violated you, you're not treating him with the disdain that he should have. Like there's no separation for him to kind of make the connection that he's done anything wrong because you've never shown him that level of anger to the degree of what he's actually done to you. And that's when it started to sink in that I literally just brought all of this upon myself because I never expressed what I actually felt. And if you know what anger is, you know, we talk about anger in the Christian, you know, concept as being this wicked thing that, you know, you shouldn't experience, that people shouldn't, you know, have. But in reality, anger is there to protect you because anger is what alerts your spirit or your body that something is wrong. When you're angry, it's because your spirit is essentially speaking up for you and telling you something is wrong. But every time I would get angry, and rightfully so, I would stifle it and be like, no, be a woman of God. No, be a Christian. No, be a this. No, turn the other cheek. No, no, no. And I was constantly denying myself of my actual emotions, expressing my actual emotions. And this is why I was in the situation I was in. So when I started to kind of process this, I started to distance myself from him. And you know, during this time, he was also like constantly asking me if he could stay in my house because at the time it was empty. Oh, can you give me, can I get the keys? You know, I want the keys, I want to stay in your house, I want to stay in your house. And I was like, you know, initially I would have said yes, but as I'm becoming more aware of the fact that this man is violating and just taking advantage of me, I started to push back and I was like, no, my brother's staying there, my brother's gonna stay there. And then his, his demeanor started to change. He started to become more angry. He started to like talk down to me. And it got to the point where when I point blank told him no, he couldn't stay at the house, he just switched. It was like, I want you to come back. I want the kids back. I want this. You're sick. You're this, you're that. I want you to bring the kids back. And I kept asking him, like, if I, even if I did send the kids back or you came to pick them up and brought them back to the UK, where would you live in your house? And I realized that this whole thing was just about getting my home because obviously from the time that I put him out of our home in 2019, he was staying with his mom and he obviously didn't want to be there anymore. It was like he wanted his own freedom, but he wanted to get it from me. And that's when it started to dawn on me, like the level of docileness that I had adopted, he knew that he could walk all over me and I would never say anything. So as soon as he started to get that pushback, I started to receive an uglier side of him. Anyway, fast forward, 
I'm in Ghana now. I'm 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 recovered. I'm recovering a bit more. I'm getting better. And he's literally like, I want you to come back. I'm gonna get my solicitors. I had basically messaged him and told him like, right, I need you to just relax. I need you to just chill. The level of you know abuse that you put me through, emotional trauma that you put me through. I'm starting to deep it now, and I really just want you to just relax. I'm gonna stay here for as long as I need to stay here to get my mind together, to, um, to get my spirit together, to get everything together, I'll come back when I'm good and ready. You're not gonna force me to do anything. And this was his response. So he stopped sending me money, um, which left me in basically with nothing because at this point, the council were aware I wasn't here. You know, the authorities were aware I wasn't here. They all knew I wasn't here. He didn't know that because I didn't communicate that to him. I was literally living off the money that he was sending me. So when he stopped sending me the money, I literally had nothing. And I was literally living off, you know, money that my, my close friend would send me, my mum would send me, my brothers were sending me. And then it got to the point where I was like, no, I can't, I can't stay here any longer because once my tenancy runs out, I'm gonna need to put like a, a large deposit down on another property, I just need to get back. So I borrowed money with the intention of paying it back because he had said to me that the money I'm not, I'm not sending you, I'm gonna put in an account, when you get back to the UK, I'm gonna give it to you. So in my mind, I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna borrow this grand and a half or whatever. I'm gonna pay for our flights to get back to the UK. I'm gonna get that money back and then I'll pay everyone back the money I've been borrowing, borrowing, borrowing just to survive and then we'll move forward from there. When I got back to the country, he didn't give me a penny. Clearly he didn't save it, he didn't give it to me. Then um, we had a meeting where, you know, again, it was like this glossing over of the way he had treated me when I was abroad and almost trying to make out like, oh no, we're cool, yeah? Like, we're all right. Sending me messages, like just talking to me as if we were friends. But literally, I had made up my mind when I got back that I would not speak to him ever again on that level. Like in my mind, I had cut him off. He was my children's father and that was the only terms that I would speak to him on. So anyway, within a week of us coming, um, he took the kids out one day. He essentially went out with a female. I don't know who this female is to this day, but the kids came back and were like, oh, we went out with daddy's best friend, this lady or whatever, whatever. And I asked him like, rah, just let me know now if you've had this plus one around my kids because I'm just warning you, I'm not the same girl that got on the plane that got off the plane. And nah, calm down, nah, I wouldn't do that, da 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 da, it wasn't her. And I was like, all right, cool, it's fine. But I'm just saying, just on top of that, if you're gonna be dating anyone or you wanna introduce anyone to my kids, just out of respect, let me know first. Don't just be bringing anyone around my children. Within the first like two weeks of us being back, apparently he crashed his car, wrote his car off, and then he called me or texted me and was like, I can't pick up the kids because I don't have a car. Bearing in mind, this man lives like 15 minutes away from us. He has a job. So if he really wanted to see his kids the way he was begging me to bring them back to the UK, he would have taken a cab and seen them as consistently as he would want to see them. The next time I see him, he comes comes to pick up the kids, he's driving another car. But then a couple more times after that, he pulls up to the house driving this white Mercedes, right? I've got a private drive, and usually whenever he picks up the kids or drop the kids, he parks on my drive. When he was driving this white Mercedes, he would park the car on the side of the road so I wouldn't be able to see the license plate. And you know like when you've been dealing with someone who's as slimy as he is for so long i knew there was something behind it because it just it just wasn't his normal pattern of behavior so i just noted it in my mind so every time he'd, he'd pick up the kids in his car he'd park on the side of the street side of the street i was like all right cool when the kids started school i asked him to meet me you know at the school so we could both see the kids off on their first day and he drove this car down to the school and the first time i saw this license plate i knew immediately that it was plus one's car number one because the first um, letter in the license plate was her first initial which is C and then it also had an RH in it which he probably thought he was being smart driving this car around where people would think oh it's his initials when in reality I'm not dumb I know what her initials are as well and it resembles very closely to her Instagram account I knew immediately that it was her car and I couldn't believe for the life of me that again for like a whole nother year of me not even being in the country I've come back here and you had the audacity to drive this woman's car and park it outside my house and pick up our children in it. And this goes to show you the level of depravity that this man is dealing with. So anyway, he comes, when I clocked it was her car, I was like, all right, cool. He comes back and I literally said, I asked him straight up, whose car is this? Oh, why do you want to know whose car this is? I said, just answer the question, whose car is this? Um, it's my friend's. I said, I figured that it wasn't your car. I just want to know who it belongs to. And he was just beating around the bush. I was like, you know what? You've answered my question without answering my question. I'm just letting you know now. If you bring this woman anywhere near my children. Anyway, so he stops driving the car outside the house for a couple of weeks and we don't see him for a while. And then the next time he comes back to the house driving that same car was on our wedding anniversary. So where does the story end? 
the story ends here the story ends now because this was only a couple of months ago obviously we haven't been in the uk all that long it's not even been a year yet but to my knowledge this is something that is clearly still continuing to this day and i've just got to the point where you know when you're dealing with someone who's on this level of depravity like there's a level of like rise above it but at the same time i wanted to share this story really to show you how degenerate you know the the system of religion can be in aiding people to destroy their own lives because i was lacking a knowledge of self you know self-worth you know self-identity i was allowing people in and around my life not just with my ex-husband not just with this plus one but also with my ex-best friend allowing these but the reason why it was continued was because i never said anything i never stood up for myself and i'm sharing this video because i know that there are millions of women around the world that have been gaslighted and spiritually abused by you know pe people in positions of you know spiritual leadership to stay in relationships that are literally destroying them from the inside out if i had trusted myself if I had trusted my intuition, I would have been out of that marriage literally as soon as it started. But because of my spiritual, what I believe to be a spiritual obligation, I put myself through eight years of hell. Eight years of hell. And at this point, I'm no longer complicit to my own pain, my own trauma, because me sharing this story is really and truly a declaration of this isn't gonna run anymore. I promised myself that I would never share this story publicly. Firstly, out of embarrassment because of the, you know, the amount of, you know, acquiescing I did and the amount of like docileness that I adopted in order to keep this man around. It was embarrassing that I even subjected myself to that level of abuse but also because I felt like there was a need for me to protect him. But I refuse to do that anymore. My life from here on out, my allegiance is to myself first, my children and my culture and restoring my spiritual sovereignty. Because everything that I ever needed to know from spirit or what I would consider to be the most high was given to me intuitively and in dreams. I didn't need a Christian church to tell me anything. And I find it so crazy how, you know, pastors will be constantly prophesying over the pulpit, you know, things that have no relevance to anybody's life. Like I even heard, you know, just this weekend gone, there was a pastor in my old church who was preaching a message and was telling, like saying that it was, you know, the spirit of God was telling him that, you know, women in the church were dating or in dating relationships with men that were not taking them serious. But the same pastors that were in the church that I was in for years, the spirit of God never came to them and told them that my husband was, was in an adulterous relationship within the church. The, the spirit of God didn't tell them that, but yet the spirit of God told me. And what I wanna make clear is that you do not need a middleman to have a connection to the most high. You do not need a middleman to have a connection to spirit. Spirit is inside of you. There's also so many things that I think really could have protected me from a lot of what actually went down. Um, like obviously I spoke about the fact that, you know, I ignored a lot of red flags, kind of pursued this relationship, but my mum wasn't happy with it from the beginning. And you know, one of the reasons why she didn't support it was because I didn't do a traditional wedding. I didn't do a traditional marriage. And I feel like if I had respected my own tradition, that level of respect for me and my family would have been there. And even if it wasn't, the fact that he'd gone to my family, like traditionally to ask for my hand in marriage without me kind of like usurping everybody, including my mum, he would have had to come back to them with that same humility and apologise to all of them for what he did. But because I kind of alienated everybody and kind of like, no, I'm getting married regardless of what anyone thinks and went through with it, when I started to get into hot water or I started to get into trouble within my marriage, I wasn't able to then tell anybody. And so there's so many different layers to this conversation. There's so many different layers, even within my own story that I've been able to reflect and learn from with regards to, as I said, like the, the reality of the situation, part that I played in it, but also coming to that realization that actually there's also a spiritual element in this as well. Like, you know, we spoke about deviances on my Instagram platform about how deviances are literally just decisions that you make that go against your intuition or decisions that you make that go against your soul essentially and you know when you're doing things that are just like it doesn't sit right with you but you're doing it anyway and it's these deviances that you make that you kind of self-sabotage yourself that you end up in situations that you're not supposed to be in but it's your inner man your spirit the spirit that the most High has put in each and every one of us 
that does that inner work. And like I said, you do not need a middleman. You do not need a pastor. You do not need a deacon. You do not need an imam. You don't need any of these spiritual leaders to be that middleman between you and the Most High. Because the, even the Bible says that his spirit is in you. You are the temple. You are the one that houses the spirit. And you are the one who is able to make decisions that are either comfortable and leads to wellness or deviances that leads to sickness whether that's emotionally physically or spiritually so i hope you know me sharing my story my full story well almost the full story like i said i had to cut out a lot of things because we would have been here all night explain it but you get the gist it was a mess and you know what led me to that mess was not knowing himself not honouring myself, not respecting myself in a way that others would respect me. You have to do that inner work. Once you respect yourself and you know yourself, then you are you put yourself in a position where other people are able to honour and respect you. Anyway, look out for the last video um, that will come out next week and I'll see you guys in my next video.